Coming up next, we air Friday's hearing before the House Government Operations Employment and Housing Subcommittee. Members met to receive testimony on alleged abuses of the Housing and Urban Development Section 8 Housing Program by former government officials. At the witness table was former Interior Secretary James Watt. Subcommittee will please come to order. These are extraordinary and historic times. From Beijing to Budapest, millions who spent their entire lives under totalitarian regimes are crying out and hundreds are dying for a free and open and democratic society. Our system is in triumph throughout the world. Yet here at home, it is the flaws of our system that predominate. I believe it was Al Smith who reminded us that the cure for democracy's ills is more democracy, more openness, and more candor. It is my strong belief and firm conviction that neither wisdom nor virtue nor high ethical behavior is the monopoly of either of our political parties. What we all seek in our imperfect ways is good and honest government. If our hearings contribute to strengthening the trust of the American people in their government, we will have accomplished our purpose. As we open this morning's hearing, I want to express my deep appreciation to my Republican and Democratic colleagues on the subcommittee for their exemplary and nonpartisan cooperation. Earlier this week, when we were compelled to issue a subpoena, we did so with a unanimous vote of all Republicans and all Democrats present. During the course of our investigation, we have had the full cooperation of the Housing and Urban Department's Inspector General, who was appointed by President Reagan and continued in office by President Bush, as well as the full cooperation of our distinguished new Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, our former colleague and good friend, Jack Kemp. This morning, the subcommittee continues its hearings on abuses and influence peddling in the Department of Housing and Urban Development federal rent subsidy program. Last week, we gave former HUD Secretary Samuel Pierce an opportunity to tell his side of the story. Today, we are giving former Interior Secretary James Watt a chance to defend his actions. He will testify about the hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees that he received as a consultant for talking to the right people, including then HUD Secretary Pierce, to obtain subsidized funds for developers who hired him. While in government, Mr. Watt often belittled federal programs to assist the poor and the less fortunate. He spoke of the dangers of being, and I shall quote, lured by the crumbs of subsidies, entitlements, and giveaways lured deep into the forest of government controls and regulation." End quote. One would have thought that when Mr. Watt left the government, he would have devoted all of his efforts to the private sector. But he apparently decided to take advantage of some of the crumbs, subsidies, and entitlements and giveaways of federal programs. In 1986, Mr. Watt was hired by a developer and paid $300,000 as a housing consultant. Yet by his own admission, he was not hired for his housing experience. He was hired to obtain HUD subsidized funds for a housing project in Maryland. At our hearing on May 25, the developer who hired Mr. Watt explained to the subcommittee, and I shall quote, Mr. Watt was a cabinet secretary and I am a million miles from that. Here was someone who clearly had access to the system. Mr. Watt can get phone calls returned at HUD. 
I can't. He could get hot to pay attention to this application, an ability I did not possess." End quote. As will become evident during the course of today's hearings, Mr. Watt's activities as a highly paid consultant were not limited to this one particular housing project in Maryland. Rather, as the title of his favorite musical group, the Beach Boys song aptly suggests, I get around. <laughs> Mr. Watt certainly got around HUD, and we will find out in what specific ways. Congressman Shays. Mr. Chairman and, and my fellow colleagues, it's very important for us to examine waste, fraud, and abuse of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I am troubled by the testimony of a number of witnesses who have appeared before us in the last few weeks. I see in HUD an agency that has been in disarray over several decades. A common theme of these hearings has been influence peddling. Hearings on this topic are important, but if our sole purpose is to establish this practice as alive and well in Washington, we are so certainly not learning anything we don't already know. The plethora of law firms, public relations agencies, and consulting firms with their Republican lobbyists working with the executive branch and their Democratic lobbyists working with Congress are constantly attempting to influence legislative and executive decisions. Influence, in pet, influence peddling is a way of life in this city. The place reeks with it. The job of housing and urban development is simply too important for us to tolerate any longer the mismanagement and abuse that pervades this agency. I intend to spend a great deal of my time in helping to clean up a distressed HUD and providing a reason for putting some pride back into an agency whose responsibility is helping rebuild America and assisting those who need shelter. In my short time in Congress, I have met and worked with many HUD employees. I have a great deal of respect for them. They are many there are many individuals at HUD who are truly dedicated to serving the common good, but they need leadership, true leadership, and much better management. Former Secretary Samuel Pierce inherited an agency that was laden with problems. Unfortunately, he left the agency no better than he found it. Under current Secretary Jack Kemp, our current Secretary Jack Kemp deserves a great deal of credit for instilling a new and very welcome sense of pride in the department. But without improving the process for handling HUD pro programs, we will fall short of our intended goal. After all, aren't we trying to improve the way housing grants are awarded? To do this, we must first establish what went wrong in the past, and from that information devise a system that restores a sense of fairness and accountability. These hearings are very important in this process. I look forward to gaining a better understanding of the workings of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. With this knowledge, we can all make a positive contribution towards rebuilding it. Thank you very much, Congressman Chase. Congressman Frank. I'll wave on a statement, Mr. Chairman, and just get to the questions. Congressman Weiss. Thank you, Thank you. We are very pleased to have uh, joining us from uh, the Housing, uh, Banking and Housing Committee, Congressman Schumann. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And first, on behalf of the whole housing subcommittee, uh, which Mr. Frank and I, on which Mr. Frank and I sit, we want to thank you first for your graciousness in inviting us here. Second, for your leadership in these hearings, which, as we sat through the housing committee for eight long years and watched program after program be decimated, and people sit there impervious uh, today, at least, is showing us a little bit about what's going on, uh, Mr. Chairman. The abuses of this program are by now well known. Favoritism and influence peddling and negligence became watchwords of the program. I for, one am <clears throat> I, for one, am outraged that Mr. Watt, who has shown about as much sensitivity to the poor as Mary Antoinette, was eating cake at their expense. While Mr. Watt fought government with one hand, he was only too happy to receive the benefits of government with the other hand. In a sense, he reminds his attitude, Mr. Watt's attitude towards government, reminds me of Sid Caesar's attitude towards his audience on the show. Uh, he used to go like this when they applauded too much. Stop, but give me more, give me more. And that's, it seems, what we've seen here. 
Mr. Watt and his Republican consultant friends gave new meaning to the old adage about the rewards of public service. As far as we can tell, the consultants provided no skill other than knowing the right people benefited handsomely to the tune of up to 1.3 million per per, 1.3 million for one person, sometimes for as little as a, for as little as a single phone call. And one other thing, Mr. Chairman, that I am interested in is the relationship between Mr. Watt and Joseph Strauss, a former special assistant to HUD Secretary Pierce who received over 1.3 million as a consultant in the moderate rehab program. Mr. Strauss is emerging as a possibly central figure in the scandal. Hopefully, Mr. Watt can enlighten us about what it was that Mr. Strauss did to elicit such phenomenal fees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Before I call our witness, I uh, want to express my appreciation, and I believe that of the whole committee, to our Chief of Staff, uh, Steve Weisberg, and to Celia Boddington for preparing uh, most of the materials for this uh, hearing. Mr. Watt, if you'll come up to the witness stand. <clears throat> if you'll raise your right hand, you swear, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. <clears throat> Mr. Watt, uh, we are pleased to have you. Uh, Thank you. I've had the opportunity of uh, having you testify um, before another subcommittee in your earlier capacity as Secretary of the Interior, and, uh, and it's nice to see you again. Uh, we uh, have not received a prepared statement from you, um, and uh, uh, if you have one, we are ready to receive it now. If you don't, uh, you may proceed in your own way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in your letter requesting me to be here, you suggested that I could have 20 minutes in my presentation. I'd like to have that uninterrupted, if I might. Uh, do, do you have a written statement? Uh, I have a prepared statement, and I'm debating at this moment whether to use it or not. Well, we would like to obtain copies so that members of the subcommittee uh, have an opportunity to study it as you, as you speak. Yes. Uh, may I have the time without interruption? Uh, I cannot make a commitment to you, Mr. Watt, because that would be unfair to all the other witnesses. This subcommittee has been uh, recognized by uh, people across the aisle. I thought, Mr. Chairman, you were suggesting it in your letter. And, uh, uh, across uh, the aisle as being meticulously fair and uh, courteous to I its witnesses. Available. I will be here all day. I'll be here as long as you want. I would just like to be able to make a presentation. We have every intention to allow you to proceed, but we cannot make a commitment that at some point we may not wish to interject. I, I, I would just that I will make the most supreme effort of self-control of my life, and I promise not to interrupt Mr. Watt. I can't promise not to squirm, grimace, and wiggle, but I won't say anything. Uh, well, you've gotten one, one flat-out uh, commitment, and, and if I can get flat-out commitments from all of my colleagues, I certainly can assure you I will not Bonnie, interrupt If Bonnie you. can do it, we all right. can yes. do it. If, uh, if Congressman and Frank, Frank gives me the pledge, I mean, the rest are easy. That'll be <laughs> you, you do yeah. realize, Mr. Watt, you have now achieved the historic first in the Congress of the United States, so you may proceed for okay. 20 minutes. Um, May we have the statement, so. Yes, uh, I need to, I have a statement and it's a short statement. I need to add to it in light of some of the comments. Please do, I want to interrupt please you. do. Um, let me first give the reporter a statement, uh, as I promised you I would. And uh, <coughs> uh, do my wife's statement. <laughs> and uh, here, here are the other committee. <clears throat> and let me just put your mind at ease that if you run over 20 minutes, that will create no problems. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we can wait here. Please go ahead. Uh, I've had an opportunity to review the testimony of my partner, Judy Siegel. She appeared for this committee. Uh, I think it's your last session. Uh, I think she did a, an excellent job. 
in the total presentation. And I want to associate by reference uh, the things I have to say today to what she had to say. If any of you members of this committee feel or interpret that I'm saying something in conflict or at variance from her testimony, uh, please uh, pursue that with questioning because there should be no, no differences in that testimony. I've also had an opportunity to review the, uh, the video of Secretary, former Secretary Pierce's uh, testimony before the committee. And uh, as it relates to his comments and his relationship with me, uh, that too is correct. Uh, if, there are very, if, if you sense you're hearing something different, uh, please pursue that with me uh, at the appropriate time because there should be no differences there. I belabor the point because frequently we don't hear what people are trying to say. And I would like that, uh, I would like that to, to be clear so that uh, we don't get uh, a debate going about something that shouldn't exist. I think you now have statements, do you not, in front of you, uh, and I had extras for the press uh, as well. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I've been requested to testify regarding the Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Inspector General's report on that program. While the Inspector General has raised many questions about the Moderate Rehabilitation Program, he has suggested no wrongdoing on my part or my partners. And yet, in my opinion, I've been singled out by the Chairman's opening remarks of May 8th with unfortunate innuendos and misleading quotes and words. Let me present some facts. I did play a role in helping bring into existence 312 units of rehabilitated low-income housing in Essex, Maryland. My business associates and I are very proud of that project, and we are proud to have been involved both with the County of Baltimore and the State of Maryland's Public Housing Authority. I have never received for my involvement in the project one nickel of federal funds. Let me repeat. I have never received any HUD funds, any federal funds, or government funds. Not U.S. government money, or state government money, or city or county tax dollars. I have received no federal funds. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has spelled out with great clarity that the fees such as were paid to me are not part of the housing project costs nor do they serve to increase tenant rents. These fees are not subject to HUD review or jurisdiction because they are paid by the developer, not the government. They are not federal funds. I'm going to read a direct quote from a HUD memorandum written by the Acting Assistant General Counsel of the Assisted Housing Division endorsed by HUD's Assistant General Counsel of Administrative Law and approved by the Chief Counsel of the Office of Government Ethics. The memorandum dated January 29, 1988 is directly on point and is titled, quote, Subject, Consultant Agreement, Section 8, Mod Rehab, end quote. That's the title of the memorandum, quoting directly. HUD does not regulate the amount or terms of contracts between a prospective Section 8 property owner and his consultant. HUD also does not recognize the cost of a consultant in its determination of subsidy amount for a moderate rehabilitation product, project. The Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program is designed so as to preclude the necessity for examining relationships of this type. Since HUD's only financial exposure is the Section 8 rent subsidy, its regulation at Section 882.408 by both generalized upper limits based upon mod rehabs, FMRs, and project-specific cost analysis 
provides adequate protection against abuse. Continuing to quote, as can be seen, consultant fees are not recognizable costs for establishing the contract rents. Consequently, provided that the consultant fee is not included in the con costs, which are used to calculate the contract rent, the owner is free to enter any agreement he desires with his consultant. Signed, Betty Park, Acting Assistant General Counsel, Assisted Housing Division. End quote. And again, I want to emphasize that that memorandum is still in effect, has always been the law, has been approved at several le levels, including the Office of Government Ethics. It is the law, it was the law, and until you folks address it, it will continue to be the law. This memorandum clearly states that the fees paid to me by the developer are not subject to HUD regulation or review because they come from the developer's potential profits, not from HUD funds or any type of government funds. Statements have been made that misinform or mislead the other members of Congress and the general public into believing that I and others benefited by receiving federal funds. That is not true. I received no federal funds, directly or indirectly. To suggest anything to the contrary is motivated by something other than a desire for the facts and the truth. Questions have been asked about the role I played in helping to provide 312 units of low-income housing in the county of Baltimore, Maryland. I did receive a fee for providing counsel and assistance to our team of business associates. How much effort and time were committed to the project? Sufficient to meet the objective of those who paid me, the developers, thus reducing their potential profit by that amount. Since the money paid to me came out of the developer's pockets, not the government's, not the tenant's, not HUD's, nor from the taxpayer's pockets, but out of the developer's potential profit, they are the ones who need to be satisfied with my services, and they are. One of the things I did in connection with the effort to bring into existence these 312 units of low-income housing was to visit with Secretary Sam Pierce. My objective was to get the career bureaucracy to review the application submitted to HUD by the state of Mar Maryland's housing authority. This was the state of Maryland's housing authority that was before HUD, government to government. This was a good project for 312 units that was being requested by a public housing authority with the full support of the County of Maryland, the State of Maryland, the Governor of Maryland, Governor Schaefer, a Democrat, to provide housing for low-income families in his state, the state of Maryland, and in addition, a responsible developer was behind this. The problem was that the HUD bureaucracy was not processing the Public Housing Authority application, which was an official entity of the state of government of Maryland. And HUD was not processing that government's application. After explaining the situation in some detail to Secretary Pierce and outlining the existing political and technical support for the project, I explained our frustrations, the frustrations in not getting the career bureaucracy to review the state of Maryland's application. Secretary Pierce explained with great care what I already knew. That is that he did not ever select a project or a developer that he was not confident that there were sufficient uncommitted appropriations to fund this project if it were approved, and that he never gave approval to any particular application. 
I countered by declaring that I was not asking him to do any of the things that he just mentioned. What I wanted was to get the career bureaucracy to process and review the Maryland Public Housing Authority application. If the project failed, that was it. If it met all the HUD requirements, it would be helpful to low-income families in the state of Maryland and the Baltimore area. The secretary said he would see what the delay was. I left his office with no commitment from him other than that he would check into it. I never asked Secretary Pierce to do anything that would embarrass him or me, and he did nothing that would embarrass me or himself. The Essex project is a powerful success, and I'm hopeful that I will get questions on that project, because that's the heart of the program. Are we delivering housing to low-income families? I helped do that. I hope the developers, my joint ventures, and business associates make a profit on the project. Mr. Chairman, there are three broad classifications of questions I expect to field. One questions concerning the Essex project. Like my partner, I will defend that project vigorously. The second type will concern the HUD Mod Rehabilitation Program. I will not defend it or its administration. The third type may be partisan attacks. I ask you, Mr. Chairman, to assist in the effort to keep this hearing professional and above partisan politics. And in your opening mark, remarks, I think you've directed your attention to that. In summary, I did successfully participate with the state of Maryland's Public Housing Authority, the county of Baltimore, and the governor of that state, and the developers to bring into existence 312 units of low-income housing in Essex, Maryland. I was paid for my efforts because the project was successfully completed. I would like to underline that. I would like you, the members of this committee, to hear that. I was paid for my efforts because the project was successfully completed. The money paid to me came from the developer's potential profits, not from HUD funds, not from federal funds, not from state funds, not from any congressional appropriations, but from the de developer's pocket. To suggest anything other than that is an error. Now, Mr. Chairman, in your most recent letter to me of January 2nd, you asked me to summarize my activities as a consultant. To, excuse me. Thank you. I thank you for that interruption. Uh, June 2nd, uh, you asked me to, to summarize my activities uh, as a consultant in lobbying for MRP funds, and in particular, I'm quoting, in particular, describe your contacts with former Secretary uh, Pierce. Let me proceed to do that. And uh, I'm sorry, I do not have a prepared statement to, to hand out on, on this subject, but uh, let me go through it slowly and we'll pick it up as needed. In early 1984, after carrying out uh, what I would call due diligence, I associated myself with Phoenix Associates in order to work on a wide variety of real estate development and investment opportunities, including, but not limited to, uh, moderate rehabilitation programs. Phoenix Associates uh, was a well-established group of lawyers and technical personnel, most of whom had experience with HUD. And my due diligence confirmed that their reputation was excellent. My informal association with, was for three purposes. One, to help secure clients for the Phoenix Associates. Two, to give general advice and counsel on their operations and strategies. And three, to assist in moving projects through HUD. I was to be paid a percentage of their fees. In turn, I was to exclusively work with them on such matters. Since 1984, I've had lead role in three projects, three HUD projects dealing with uh, MRP or three, you can just leave it at three HUD projects. My first project was Corinthian Towers in New Jersey. This project had been before the Washington HUD office for many years, years. I'm not misspeaking, I'm talking about years. The need was to get the career employees to act upon the paperwork before HUD. 
this project, I believe, was 271 units. I'm a little fuzzy on this, but I think it was commenced in 1976, but anyway, in the mid to late 1970s. It was almost completed. I think the figure is about 80% completed. And it never, it wasn't finished, and vandalism, deterioration commenced. HUD had to hire armed guards to protect their facility. Developers of New Jersey, in driving around the community, identified this federal asset that wasn't showing compassion by delivering homes for those less fortunate. Two developers came into the scene, spotted this facility, and felt that they could make a go of it. And they submitted their applications to the state authorities, the public housing authorities, and were urged and encouraged by the governments, public housing authorities, state, whatever they are, New Jersey, and I don't know all of those, to get involved and make homes available to low-income families. And they came forward with proposal after proposal, but HUD here in Washington wouldn't address the issues. The Phoenix Associates people worked on it and worked on it, as I understand this, couldn't get a response. I was asked to focus on Corinthian Tower. It seemed like a straightforward, easily defined task. And further, a task that should not have had to be done. However, the Phoenix Associate professionals were so frustrated they were ready to give up on it. But it looked straightforward to me. And I contacted the Federal Housing Commissioner, Barksdale. Simple matter. Mr. Barksdale, Commissioner of Federal Housing, would you ask the career civil servants to pick up the applications coming from the state of New Jersey and try to rehabilitate, try to get your hands on this facility so that people could have a home? They had worked on it for many months, and I don't know the exact number of months, but I moved in and I asked uh, Barksdale. I met with him personally. I called him repeatedly for months. Months. And finally, the career people did address the issue and the project was built and people now live in it. And I am proud of that project. I am proud to have been involved in bringing homes to people. I cannot prove that I was the ingredient that made it happen, but I believe I was an integral part of that, and I am proud of it. I believe it was during that time frame that I and a Phoenix associate member attending a meeting in Deborah Dean's office. It was a meeting on a series of technical issues that the Phoenix associates had before HUD dealing with technical things uh, on several projects. My primary purpose in attending that meeting was to learn more about HUD, its operations, and its people. I did not have a lead role in that meeting and cannot even recall any of the specifics of the meeting and that there were several things and I expect to be pushed on naming the projects and I'm just not, I have no recollection of, of the specific projects. I did not have the lead on that, but I did meet in her office with this Phoenix Associates. What I learned as a result of that meeting and the many meetings, telephone and personal, with Barksdale was important. And I came to the conclusion that the political appointees at HUD were immobilized with the fear of doing something wrong and therefore applications were not even being reviewed. Fear paralyzed an agency. The political appointees, in my opinion, couldn't be counted upon to give direction to the career employees because of fear. Near paralysis was the result. 
I determined it was a waste of time to go, in, go to anyone other than Secretary Pierce. The second project I was involved in concerned the desire to have allocation of units assigned to Puerto Rico with the expectation that uh, clients would be able to compete and secure those units from the, from the authorities in Puerto Rico. I set up the appointment with Secretary Pierce and in the process noted four people of, of my coming. The then Housing Commissioner, Deborah Dean, Pierce's personal secretary, and Pierce himself. I wanted no one in the organization to be blindsided, and further my style is to keep everyone informed so that maybe some one of those informed will follow through. I met with Secretary Pierce. We visited about personal matters, as friends will do. I then explained in detail what we wanted to do in Puerto Rico and why. I explained why our project was so good and that would win the competition of the Public Housing Authority of Puerto Rico were given the allocation of units and held their competition for the, for the distribution of those units. Secretary Pierce responded again, or this was the first time he did it for me, but as I've already testified, with a strong emphasis that he did not approve any specific project or any developer, that he was not sure there were sufficient funds uh, unallocated to meet our project needs if the Puerto Rico Public Housing Authority selected our project and that he could not direct Puerto Rico to select any particular project. He was consistent on that in the two times I met with Secretary Pierce. I, of course, had already learned that and assured him that I did not want him to do any of the things that he had just mentioned. We simply wanted a chance to compete in meeting the needs of Puerto Rico. Secretary Pierce promised me nothing other than that he would ask staff to look into the matter. Sometime later, an allocation of units was made to Puerto Rico. Without belaboring the Puerto Rico situation, let me be summarized by saying that our client was awarded after competition a portion of the units and has built a fine housing project providing homes for low-income families in Puerto Rico, and I am again proud of that project. And you'll note, members of this committee, that I've talked about three projects, and I'm proud of every one of those, and I'm hopeful that you'll focus on housing and that's what I've been involved in. Uh, the third involvement with HUD has already been well documented by my partner, Judy Siegel. Her account is exact. I neither add nor subtract from her presentation. Judy had also worked with Phoenix Associates, and it was there I had learned of her tremendous abilities and professional reputation. In about January of 1986, she needed office space I had extra rooms in my suite of offices. We agreed to work together much the same way Phoenix and I and Associates and I had been working. I would help secure clients, give general advice and counsel on our activities, and assist her at HUD. In May of 1986, I returned to my native state of Wyoming and uh, terminated those relationships. But it was after Judy moved into our offices that, uh, that we did obtain the client, uh, and she became identified the property and she became the developer to develop the Essex project, which is a splendid project uh, for which I'm very proud. I stand behind these projects that we worked on. They are the type of projects that we need. They are private initiatives. We need to, we need to develop efficient programs that will deliver housing homes to people in this country. And I'm proud to have been involved in that association to bring about these units. And I'm proud not to have received federal funds. I received no HUD funds. I received no tax dollars, none whatsoever. I was paid by the developer. He did not get the monies to pay me from federal funds, HUD funds, or any government funds. And to suggest anything to the contrary is a lack of understanding of the program or different motives. And I want that to be understood by the press and the people that are listening to this on C-SPAN or wherever. I want them to understand that no funds came to me from federal 
taxpayers' dollars, state taxpayers' dollars, county taxpayers' dollars, HUD funds, federal funds, any type of this. If there's one point I would like to communicate, that would be it. And I want to emphasize that, and I think I have, and uh, I imagine not I'll have an opportunity to emphasize it again and again, and let me tell you, you're going to hear it. If there's any deviation from that, repeatedly. Mr. Chairman, the committee has been uh, true to its word. I commend each and every one of you. Thank you for that. And I submit myself to questions at this time. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Watt. Uh, you have raised uh, many more questions with your testimony than I initially anticipated asking. So let me begin with uh, the last point you emphasized, which you repeated and emphasized both in your written testimony and orally with uh, uh, the powerful articulateness that we have grown accustomed to from you. Thank you. If uh, Shakespeare were here, he would say, methinks the lady doth protest too much. <laughs> and I, I really am at a loss in making up my mind whether your passionate ideological commitment blinds you to some obvious facts uh, or whether you for some reason are determined to make a point which is truly not that relevant to our investigation. You're a very intelligent man and you know as well as I do that dollars are fungible. There is no such thing as federal tax dollars and state tax dollars and county tax dollars and city tax dollars and private sector dollars. There are only dollars. You received you received $300,000 on one project, for instance, and those were dollars. Those dollars didn't have written on them that these are private sector dollars or federal sector dollars. This distinction is, is, a, is, a, uh, is a peculiar ideological aberration that I don't want to probe the genesis of. But I, I sort of want you to understand that you severely underestimate the intelligence of the members of this committee if you think that we don't understand that you're obtaining the units for the developer who paid you enable that developer to have huge tax credits and profits from which he paid you. Now, we are not criticizing uh, you or anybody else for making a living. But I really think that it is not productive. It serves no, no useful purpose uh, for us to dwell on this any longer. You have attempted to make this point crystal clear. You surely did not. Because your $300,000 fee from the Maryland project came about because you persuaded Mr. Pierce or Ms. Dean or whoever else had the final say about giving the units to this particular developer. Uh, and, and the funds were just honest to goodness United States dollars. They were not federal dollars, county dollars, state dollars. They were dollars. That's what you received. But I don't want to spend more time on this. Some of my colleagues may wish to explore this with you. You may wish to return to this issue. You have a sort of a pathological desire to denounce public funds. Well, uh, your president and my president, George Bush, is paid out of public funds. He's not ashamed to get a paycheck of, quote, unquote, to use your term terminology, federal dollars. Sandra Day O'Connor, distinguished Supreme Court Justice, receives federal dollars. Um, our Secretary of Defense, our former fine colleague, Richard Cheney, receives federal dollars. Uh, Governor Keene of New Jersey receives state dollars. Fine county and municipal officials receive, quote unquote, county or municipal dollars. So it is somewhat nauseating to hear this thing repeated ad infinitum. We have gotten your point. We totally disagree with your point. At least I totally disagree with your point. 
you receive $300,000 for this particular intervention, influence peddling, because federal funds and federal tax credit flowed to this particular developer. This is our reading. You will have plenty of opportunity to comment. Now or later? Not now. Not now. Mr. Chairman, yield. I'll be happy to yield my colleague. I just want to make very clear, Mr. Chairman, I uh, disagree with your own particular definition of, uh, of government funds. And I know when I'm taxed, I am taxed on separate forms from the federal, separate forms from the state, separate forms from the city. So I understand uh, the desire here to make a point. I would hope that we can get to the quote, questions that are to be asked so that we can both, all of us, can benefit from the information from all the sources. I, I, uh, I would like... With all due deference to my good friend. I would like to tell my good friend that just as we have given uh, Mr. Watt all the time he asked for uh, without any interruption, so we will give you and all other members of the committee all the time you desire uh, to pursue any, any line of inquiry you wish. Uh, <laughs> I would like to also make a sort of a general observation about your repeated statement of pride that uh, low-income individuals uh, are enjoying proper housing in these various projects. Mr. Pierce testified to us, and I believe uh, your entire record during that period would make you agree with him. If you don't, you'll have a chance to comment on this. That his purpose was to kill this program. His purpose was to eliminate this program. And because there were enough of us in the Congress who prevented him and others of similar persuasion to terminate these programs, on a much reduced basis, these programs continued. And I think it is somewhat unseemly for you, whose whole philosophy is so totally in the opposite direction, to take such great pride in the fact that overriding administration hopes and actions to terminate this program the majority of the Congress succeeded in preserving truncated portions of these programs so that low-income individuals can obtain, certainly not in all instances, but in some instances, some public housing. It ill behooves you, given your countless public statements on this matter, to take such great pride. The people who should take great pride are the people who fought for these programs, who tried to protect and preserve these programs, the people who devoted their careers to seeing to it that some housing for low-income people is provided, not people who attempted to kill the program. As I told Mr. Pierce a week or so ago, you tried to kill it, and you couldn't kill it, you milked it. Those are the facts, and both the Congress and the American people know this. Now, let me come to some uh, additional observations in your testimony before I begin my sequential questioning. You made one statement, Mr. Watt, with which I fully agree. In discussing, I believe, the New Jersey project in which you were involved, you said, and I believe I'm quoting you accurately, if not, you feel free to interrupt me. The task, namely the task you had, the task should not have had to be done. Correct. Is that an accurate quote? That is correct. We could not agree with you more. That is really, now you are really dealing with the gut issue in this investigation. The $300,000 to you the 1.3 million to somebody else, the other huge fees should not have had to be paid. They shouldn't have had to be paid just as funds must not be paid when a public program like the appointment of promising young men and women to our service academies is on the books every 
high school graduate, woman or man, of any race, creed, color, can apply to be appointed to West Point or Annapolis, one of the most pleasant and difficult tasks each of us has in the Congress. Those places are there. Those places are never enough to satisfy all of the qualified young men and women who want to serve this nation as officers in the Air Force or the Army or the Navy or the Marine Corps. And we try to allocate those on the basis of competitive examinations, competitive testing, competitive screening. In my own case, I have a group of retired military officers who have constituted themselves into a committee and they make the decisions which I just approved. Now you would be outraged, I trust, I know I would be outraged, if we would find that this process in some congressional district is not working and somebody is getting five, 10, 15, $20,000 fees to get these very precious things allocated. And they're worth more than $20,000 because training as a pilot at the United States Air Force Academy is a very valuable, materially valuable thing which members of Congress, as part of their duty, allocate on the basis of objective criteria. So you surely are on the same wavelength with this one comment. The task should not have had to be done. That's absolutely true. Now let me come to some specifics. I want to deal with the fee arrangement you had with uh, the Maryland developer, and uh, I'd like to sort of follow through for the record um, how this was uh, handled in terms of taxes. You had a contract with the developer with respect to a housing project in Essex, Maryland. Uh, she hired you to obtain HUD subsidized funds, and in return you were to be paid $300,000. Is that correct? Not entirely. Please, please uh, <coughs> rephrase it so it will be correct. The business, my business associate, who shared my offices, uh, identified this project that had earlier been identified by the state of Maryland for rehabilitation to meet needs. And uh, my partner then put together a team of persons that could underwrite it and finance it, bring the technical capabilities to bear, and I was a member of that team, and I was involved in that process uh, from beginning to end with a heavy emphasis on the tax considerations because that is where the funds come from, not from HUD legislation. So I, I'm, I will risk irritating you here, Mr. Chairman. You but, don't irritate uh, me, sir. But, uh, there is a massive distinction from where these funds do come. I did agree to participate with that team in the total complex of complex in the total complexity of this project, and one of my functions was to see if we couldn't assist the state of Maryland, the governor of Maryland, the public housing authority, the county officials in getting HUD to approve the allocation of units so that that project could be developed. Um, the monies I was to be paid would come from the tax play on the syndication, not from any HUD funds. The developer, and I think there's a lack of understanding. No, there that, isn't. There, don't don't, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, treat us with condescension. We Mr. understand far Mr. Chairman, too well. May I finish the sentence? Maybe far too well for your own benefit. Yeah. Maybe I was going to say a lack of understanding on my part, but I didn't get to say that, did I? I know that. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Bond. I'm just pausing here. Please. Uh, yeah. You were saying there's a lack of understanding with how this was being developed. The. Uh, The need was to, to bring that the, uh, the
The need was to, to bring that complex operation into existence. I was to be paid the money. The money would only be made available if the project were syndicated because there are no eligible costs allowed by HUD for consulting fees or advice given like we were talking about. There is no eligible cost permitted by HUD for these kind of fees. We understand that. So I, the costs of the project to HUD would be the same whether they hired a consultant or not. It had no bearing on the cost of this project or the rents paid by tenants. No bearing. And, uh, and I was involved to assist in the total effort and uh, participated with my team players on that and successfully brought it to fruition. Well, let me then restate the question. <clears throat> you had a contract with a developer with respect to the Essex Maryland project uh, for which you were to be paid $300,000. Is that correct? I was to be paid $300,000 if the project were successfully completed. That's correct. How was the figure of $300,000 arrived at? It, uh, it, was the, uh, it was the offered amount and kind of the going, the going rate. Uh, the going rate of what? There, as I think Secretary Pierce test, the going rate, they, the, the street knowledge is that uh, if you can get these, and uh, it used to be higher in the late 70s that, uh, that uh, there was a thousand to two thousand dollars a unit, and that's what they offered. Uh, they offered three hundred thousand, and uh, that's the way it was settled. It wasn't negotiated. It was just offered. Seemed seemed like a lot of money to me. <coughs> Your well, it certainly seems like a lot of money to the people who live in those subsidized public housing projects, because those people may be making ten thousand dollars a year, and in a lifetime they don't make this money. And they're but, very grateful to have a home. They're grateful that we were successful in bringing this project no, to fruition. No, no, Mr. Watt, I already explained to you. They are grateful to the people who prevented the program from being totally destroyed by Pierce and people who agreed with Pierce, who is on the record saying that that's what he intended to do. Uh, I'm not contesting anything you've said on that, Mr. Chairman. So let's leave the gratitude aspect out uh, of it, because I don't think that deals it, it, with the It's issue. hard. I understand why you say that, of course. Of course you do. But it's hard not to focus on it when you see the facility and you see the people and you realize that, that that project may not have come into existence. That's right. A more worthy project could have come into existence. That's one of our concerns. I don't this know about project that, came into existence because of influence peddling by you. A much more worthy and desirable and necessary project where they didn't have the good judgment to hire you because you knew Pierce didn't come into being. So this thing does not appear in isolation. And I think you, you understand this every bit as well as we do. So let's put the great pride aside. The, the fact with respect to the pride remains that there was an attempt to kill the program when it couldn't be killed entirely. What was retained was being taken advantage of. Ms. Dean indicates in her interview with the Wall Street Journal that the program was politically managed, politically handled. Well, that's obvious. So, so while some people now have housing, other people more deserving in worse conditions may not have housing because of these wonderful involvements. Um, Ms. Siegel testified that with respect to the $300,000 that uh, was paid to you, she and her partner sent you a check for $169,000 and were directed by you to send the other $131,000 to Phoenix Associates uh, because you owed uh, the principal, uh, Ms. Strauss, money on another project. Is that correct? Uh, 
I don't believe that's what she did testify to. I did direct her to transfer. That is what she testified to. You may testify differently uh, if you wish. Uh, Judy Siegel and I are not at odds. Uh, I did direct that uh, 131,000 be uh, transferred to Phoenix Associates, yes. Uh, we had agreed to share the fees on that project and other projects, and uh, it was for that reason that we were sh sharing the fees. Is it, uh, yes? Who was there? The, the you and Ms. Siegel or you and Phoenix? Yourself? Phoenix and I. Thank you. Uh, in your uh, statement to the Inspector General, uh, you said the following, and I'm quoting from the Inspector General's uh, report. What said, the only money he received from the Berkeley project was $169,002 in three checks. He recalled that additional money was to be paid to him, but instead it went to Joe Strauss because he what owed Strauss money which was related to another venture in which they were involved. That, is that correct? Uh, that's not a correct quote, but uh, I don't know that it makes much, maybe we're haggling over something that's not important. That's, I made the, I drew exception because that, I think what you're quoting was from the Inspector General's, not from Judy Siegel's that's testimony. Correct. That's correct, that's what so, I said. From so I was correcting General. that on Judy, because Judy and I are not at odds. Well, Judy Siegel also makes. She says that I directed that the 131 be there, and that's because of fee sharing arrangements that I have with the uh, Phoenix Associates. In your uh, telephonic interview yeah. by Special Agent Wayne D. Ziegler on December 16, 1988, um, Mr. Ziegler, in his summary, and please correct Mr. Ziegler's statement if it's not accurate, says well, I the think following. I have. I'm sorry. I, I thought I had to you. You've read that to me, and I thought I had corrected it. What is the substance of your correction? Well, and I don't know that, again, I don't want to be haggling over something that Joe, with Phoenix Associates or Joe Strauss, I was fee sharing, and I, I, sh I, I sent or would have paid him, and I asked Judy to do it, to transfer the check to him for that, for that amount. Well, let me ask you a general question, Mr. Watt, because this raises some very interesting matters. Is it your customary practice to tell individuals who owe you money for services to direct portions of the payment to go to different entities? Sometimes it's the convenient way to do it. Um, well, if she owed you $300,000, that was your agreement, uh, why didn't she send it to you and then you write a check for whatever amount you owe to your mortgage company, to anybody else. Could, could, have, could have worked that way. How, uh, <clears throat> um, Ms. Siegel testified also that Form 1099, miscellaneous income, that she sent to you and to the Internal Revenue Service was for the amount of $169,000. No, excuse me, Please. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please, that's not correct. That is not correct. She testified that she sent me a check for a third of that, and that she, and, and, and the, and the a, and she gave me a 1099 for her third. That's right. The other and two checks totaling that amount, 169, uh, came to from two to other me. people. And I didn't get 1099s from them, and I run them all through a company, and so it's a company to company check, and you don't need the 1099s. I'm just. Uh, I I'm was. Being, I'm being. I'm responding too quickly because they're not right. quite accurate. But right. the, the, How was the 131000 that Ms. Siegel paid to Phoenix Associates <laughs> handled tax-wise? I wasn't involved in it, so I assume it... Uh, I'm, well, I'm you looking. earned the funds. It was your income. No, it was not my income. Well, you had a contract with her for $300,000, yes. and you directed her to ship 131000 to somebody else. Okay. There's two ways... Excuse me. Please. I don't mean that. No, no, here. please explain it to the, us. The uh, two ways to handle it, of course. I could have accepted the, the $300,000 check and turned around and written one, expensed it out as a 131000 The bottom line would have been that I would be paying taxes on 169000 or, in the alternative, I can say to the companies that are involved with that, the developers, send the money direct to that person. It has no, there's no difference on my statement 
and reported income, there's no difference on his or there's no difference on uh, Judy and her partner. But does the IRS uh, approve of this practice? Let's assume that you are in a much higher bracket than the other recipient. It would make no difference because, I, no difference. because I would expense it out totally and it would be the bottom line is the same. But you have to list it as an income and an expense on your return, don't if you? If I received it. I did not receive it. It would make no difference to IRS. Well, you didn't receive it because you directed that you not receive it. That's right. It. Had I received it, it would have been the same thing. D did you amend that return at any time? No. No, it has never been amended. We will want to return to this. Uh, how many meetings altogether did you have with Mr. Pierce? Two. And would you estimate the length of each of those meetings? Oh, not, not long periods of time. 15 to 30 minutes, that was Mr. Pierce's recollection. I would guess, that's fair, fair guess. So in terms of personal meetings with the Secretary of Labor, uh, Housing and Urban Development, you had a total of 30 to 60 minutes in connection with all of your health projects. The, uh, I've only met with him twice, yeah, twice. on any other project. That's now, it. how about telephone calls? How many do you, would you estimate? With Secretary Pierce? Yes. Uh, probably two, but um, setting up the meetings, but maybe I don't remember. Maybe, maybe I, at least I at least set up one with him directly. I may have set it up the other through his yeah. staff. I, so I a few phone calls, Very one, two, three, four phone That's calls. Right. Okay. Now, how many meetings did you have with other HUD officials in connection with all of these projects you've worked on this month? Um, <clears throat> I don't know the number. Approximately. But with regard to the Corinthian Towers projects, many, many, many. I'm, I'm lumping telephone and personal together because, you know, it's a meeting's a meeting, whether it's telephonic or in, in person. I had many meetings at Corinthians Tower. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. What was your total income from HUD-related activity? Um, <clears throat> Both income that you received yeah. directly and income you had directed to other entities. I don't have uh, those figures here. They are not funds that... Uh, well, you expected to be asked about that. I mean, we have been dealing with this hearing for a long time, so it's not an unexpected That's question. correct. And I don't have those figures here. They are not figures that are subject to HUD review because they are not uh, government monies. They are monies that I earned in a private relationship under private contract, not subject to government uh, HUD review. And uh, there uh, ought to be some proprietary uh, privilege to privacy here about, uh, about my income. I want to cooperate fully. But I, these funds are not HUD funds. They did not come from the, the government. And uh, therefore, HUD has no jurisdiction. I am not asking about HUD's jurisdiction. You have made it clear that you view these as, <coughs> as private funds. That's correct. They are nevertheless private funds that you obtained in conjunction with your HUD-related activities. Isn't that correct? They are funds that I earned uh, related to act activities that I carried out and I did contact HUD in, in a portion of the services rendered for securing those funds. Well, you indicated there were three types of transactions, the Maryland transactions, the New Jersey and the Puerto Rico transactions. Is that correct? Th then I was involved, uh, I don't want to, that's, those are the ones I had the lead on. There were other projects, as I've mentioned, yes. that, uh, that I didn't have the lead on that were technical of nature. And, uh, like Could you the, list those other projects? Uh, frankly, I don't even remember them, as I testified already. I don't even remember what the... Well, the were lead. there two other projects or ten I, other projects? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't that directly involved in, in those technical type situations. But there, you're quite right that I had the lead on three projects. Corinthians that had been what small. was the fee attached to that that fee uh, I want to cooperate with you we appreciate and that. Uh, I want to make an issue that that is not subject to HUD review we you made that point and we stipulate that 
the, really the, developer, the developer <laughs> could have paid you $10 million for influence peddling or $10,000 <clears> or nothing. They could have just said thank you. And it wouldn't have affected the cost of the project one cent. So what was the amount, Mr. Watt? Uh, I'd like to, to comment on the term influence peddling, if I might. Well, why don't you answer the question first and then comment? Might not get a chance to make the other comment. You I will. will. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good. Um, I believe that figure was $20,000. Okay. And the third project where you had the lead role? The, uh, the Puerto Rican project. I've been paid on that when uh, I note the protest under I want to cooperate and that it's not HUD jurisdiction and all that. I want the record to note that. I think it's important because we're, we're invading privacy here. And I, I don't like that. I don't believe but so. But I'm such a public figure that I need to cooperate, but I fear for the other businessmen of America who have to be subjected to this. And there really is. And, it's, and it, it reflects poorly. It reflects poorly. Uh, the, the amounts that, uh, that I've been paid on the third project are $100,000. Okay, so we are talking about on the three <coughs> projects on which you had lead 300, 120, 420. I did not receive the 300, as you've noted. That's, well, <laughs> you directed a portion of it That's not right. to be received. <coughs> but since you owed that money, you beneficially received it, did you not? Uh, that you claimed you owed it to Phoenix on another project. Mr. Chairman? I have corrected that twice now. This will be the third time. Mm -hmm. That statement is a statement that the IG report wrote up. I yeah. have corrected it twice before. This is the third time. I did fee sharing. If you want to call that owing, then owing is okay. So yes, I received $169,000 on that project. Very good. Uh, I'll call on, um, on uh, Mr. Lukens to continue the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I'm also very interested in um, this concept of fee sharing. I'd go back and clear that, that up uh, in my mind, at least. I don't know if it will affect the other members, but uh, I'm concerned. If you received 169000 Mr. Watts, totally, and then you had, you say, expensed it out, you, owe you owed two-thirds of it to the other partner who was splitting the fee, how would that have worked? Uh, from your standpoint, if you'd gone the other route, step by step? The Congressman, it would have been absolutely zero difference. The IRS implications are equal under either way. Explain that step by step, please. Okay, if, if I had taken in the $300,000 from a check from these three developers and then written a check to my partner, Phoenix Associates, for 131. I would have reported to IRS revenue of $169,000. Instead of going through that cumbersome route, I directed that the three developers give the, the fee sharing arrangement directly to my partner. They did that. They expensed it out. It was still a net expense to them of $300,000. My taxable income was still $169,000, and the impact with IRS is absolutely zero difference whichever way you go. So if you had done it the other way, the IRS would have, uh, would have still accepted that as the legitimate way to file. That's, it didn't absolutely, matter. Absolutely. Right. Let me ask this. How long was that project languishing there before your group, or I assume that you were part of a team with the lead That's person, right. is that correct? Before your team went to work on the project, how long had it been there? <clears throat> Over two years, it had uh, been selected by the state of Maryland, the Essex Project, two years before my partner identified it as something. We worked on it for 17 months before, it, before the fees were paid on it and it was completed. So your 169000 represented a year and a half of work, uh, essentially. Uh, even more than that, yeah. What role? Uh, could Mr. Barksdale or Mr. Demery, and I'm not sure, I, I understand Mr. Barksdale um, is the, the state commissioner of housing? No, Barksdale, the congressman, was the uh, federal housing commissioner. Uh, for the Baltimore, Maryland area? In, no, no, here in Washington for HUD in, I don't know what years, but at least in 1984. And Mr. Demery? Uh, he came on uh, 
I never had any business dealings with Mr. Demery, but he came on the scene later. I don't know when he came 86. on. Okay, 86. 86. And I never had any dealings you with him. You dealt with only Mr. Barksdale. Mr. Barksdale is the one I dealt with. Why did you see, why did you believe that you had to go to Secretary Pierce? Was it so dead that nobody else would move except the Secretary? That was the conclusion I came to, yes. Had others tried to move the project off dead center? Yes. Repeatedly, uh, the Phoenix Associates professionals had tried. Excuse me, now I, I'm getting, I may be mixing my projects here. Uh, on the Corinthians project, the Phoenix Associates had worked for months and months and months, and it had languished for years before that. On the Corinthians project, and Congressman, maybe I've confused the issue. On the Corinthians project, that's been laying around since the mid 70s with people working on it. So if I've confused those issues, the record may be confusing. Corinthians has laid around for years with ineptness. Could this project have been successfully completed without the complete support of the state of Maryland? Not at all. Not at all. They had to file the application. They were enthusiastic about it. The governor personally supported it. Uh, the county of Baltimore supported it. It was their application that uh, had languished for a couple years and was reactivated and that, uh, that we made happen. Is that a basically fair appraisal of all housing projects located in any state or, or possession of Commonwealth like Puerto Rico? Could you have accomplished that project, which I assume was also successfully accomplished? Yes, it was. Uh, without the, the very real and active support of the Commonwealth? That's a, that question needs to be asked and pursued, and thank you for asking it. The answer is absolutely not. The state had to play the role and do the job, and they're just frustrated at the inability, and this gets to what the chairman talked about earlier, the states and the public housing authorities have become frustrated with this process. You met with Secretary Pierce, I think you said uh, twice. Correct. And I think to his recollection, he thought he'd met with you once, but there had been several phone calls in addition. That's correct. You mentioned you met with Secretary Pierce uh, regarding all three of these items, I understand. No, just, we, just two of them. Two of housing. Uh, were, others there with, were others there with you uh, when you met with Secretary Pierce? No. You met only on moderate rehab programs in the MRD? That's correct. And you, excuse me, I only met with uh, Secretary Pierce? Yes. Yes, just the, on these two, two issues. That's and right. both times with the moderate rehab. That's correct. Um, what else did you do as a consultant to earn the fees? I, I was a team member uh, with, with Phoenix Associates. I helped recruit clients. Uh, I was involved in strategies. We were involved in a lot of different projects besides HUD. Uh, and uh, we, we had lots of concern about tax treatment and tax law and tax concepts because that's where the money comes from. And so we, we spent lots of times on those issues because without the tax law driving this program, nothing would happen. And that's why I make the big issues that I do because it's housing legislation passed in and of itself is not going to affect these issues as I'm talking as a matter of public policy now. And, and that needs to be addressed. So as, as a member of these teams, the, the, uh, the Essex team and the Phoenix teams, we spent lots of time on those issues. You're basically saying then that all the housing programs in the world with money attached still would not move a state or a developer more specifically to move into the area of low cost specifically and moderate cost housing unless there's a real tax gain. <clears throat> and so, secondly, does uh, the current tax law, um, law, the reform of 86, affect the developer's approach to housing today? Uh, Congressman, I'm really not qualified to go into that because I dropped out about then. And uh, it's much more difficult. And in the, in the Essex case, we got caught in that change. And it took a lot of time to work that out. Uh, so I'm really not, uh, I do no consulting now for any clients, any place, at any time. I do not practice law with any clients at any place or any time now, so I'm not up on that to respond to that. Why do developers feel it necessary to go to consultants in the first place? If you had not done this, obviously they would have gone to some other consultant to do this. 
you mentioned in your opening statement a certain reluctance, at least, of some bureaucrats in the system to move or to make a decision. Is, is that paralysis, uh, is it extant today? I mean, is it there today and it prevents more housing projects from being developed? Well, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm into the area of speculation because I'm not current on what's going on today. But uh, uh, paralysis is a big problem with, with the government always. And we have paralysis by analysis. Um, and the paralysis comes because of, of fear of doing something wrong. And if, if they get caught off base doing something wrong, bad judgment, you know, they have to testify before Congress or the press gives them a bad time, so they just freeze. And uh, that's unfortunately bad government. You know, we, we need to do things. And we need to take some risks, as uh, I'm speaking from a pub public policy point of view, uh, to get things done. And, and we just have paralysis. What was the paralysis that caused this project to wait for two years and the Corinthian to wait for five or six? Uh, what delayed it? I can't, you know, that question should be pursued, and I'm, I hope this committee uh, pursues that philosophy. I don't have the answer. Why could not? Federal Housing Commissioner or a, or a parallel authority, at least some level approaching that or above that. I assume there's a step between the Federal Housing Commissioner and the Secretary. There may not be. Why can not someone, you know, have authorized moving on the program before? Did it really take Secretary Pierce's personal involvement, personal um, encouragement, or even orders to a subordinate to move on this project before it moved? Is that really what happened? Uh, apparently. I found in the conversations I had uh, with the politicals, now I never talked to a career employee on this, uh, but what I found was that they were afraid to make a decision, and so they, they wouldn't make a decision unless the career employee signed off on it. And that was fine with me. So if these projects I was involved in didn't pass every, every degree of regulation, perfection, demand, then we shouldn't have them. So I never, never met with a career employee. The politicals were afraid to make a decision, and I, that's because they needed the career employee to do it, and then the, but they weren't giving direction to the career employee to do it. So just nothing happened. And, and I understand why the political appointees insisted upon these projects to be perfect. That's a fine objective, and I, th I think they were. Mr. The prayer people wouldn't have let them through. Thank you, Mr. Watt. Aside from your natural reluctance to want to come before another committee if you decide to go back into the housing business ever, what situation would convince you and others like you, uh, if, it, if that's what it takes to move housing today, to ever come back into a housing developing consulting uh, mode? Well, with the current spotlight on everyone, and I, I think some are wrong, I think some are terribly, terribly wrong. Um, what, what does it take to, to move housing? I mean, we seem to be held up in so many housing projects, and, and I look at, I get several complaints from my own developers, now I'm getting them out of state, and they just don't seem to understand what happened at a certain level where nothing moves at all. What would it take to free uh, this paralysis? Uh, Congressman, you're giving me a license to just speculate. Uh, well, after this committee, I think you deserve at least one puffball, <laughs> so go ahead. Uh, the climate in Washington is so bad today, I cannot visualize anything that would attract people like me to come back. Because you have a natural, uh, I'm going to say natural dislike probably for uh, the bureaucratic environment, but I'm speaking more as a professional consultant. Okay to the worthwhile, honest developers who really do want to solve a housing the, problem. Then you, and that's... From that standpoint, yeah. what, what would bring them back in? We what need would speed up the program? What would help us solve the problem? You need to go more to the voucher program, more initiative program, and reduce the role of the government obstacles to so it. So empowering the tenant or tenant associations to move in the area of their own self-government. Thank you. I think, you know, I just believe in local government, state and local government. And when you get in here, the climate of the Congress is bad, very bad today. You feel it throughout the town. The, the climate in, in the agencies are very bad. And, uh, you know, 
there are just a lot of ways to enjoy life, and one of them is to live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And that's what I've chosen to do. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Walks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Frank. Thank you. And I understand how that feels. I, some of us are still enjoying life mostly here. I, I want to say, Mr. Watt, that I appreciated your strong support of comments about the program and about the need, and I mean this quite seriously, for helping people live decently. I, I thought as I listened to you that had you been the Secretary of HUD instead of where you were, we probably would have been collaborating more. I, I appreciate that, and I, I, I think that attitude is, is a correct one, because you do point out that there is a, a legitimate role, and I think maximizing the public-private cooperation is part of it. Um, but that's, that's one of what I want to talk about with the money. I very much agree with you that on the given project, the Essex project, that, uh, and, and I, I appreciate your clarifying it, $300,000 was the fee that the developer had to pay to get the help. You didn't get all of it, but I, so I think we agree with that. Um, and on the project-by-project project basis, the fact that they had to pay $300,000 to be divided between you and your partners did not, at that time, add to the cost of the tenants. That's correct. But I think you would agree, and I know you fought for this, to the extent, however, that government is so structured that the private venturers in government have to spend more and more of their own money on things, inevitably that's going to increase the price the government is going to have to pay to induce them in. Now, you, I, I'm sure you agree with that. So in other words, the money you got, in that circumstance, it didn't reduce the tax take. It was syndication profits, and syndication profits are taxes not paid to the government. In fact, uh, President Reagan was so unhappy at the tax loss that these kind of syndication profits gave that he urged Congress, and Congress gave in more than I should have, in my judgment, in the 86 tax bill, to substantially reduce that. So that's, I think, the point. In the given case, the money you took didn't come from well, the money you earned. Uh, it didn't come from, uh, it, it didn't add to the project cost. But by having a situation where, as you describe it, five and six years into the Reagan administration, the bureaucracy is non-functional, and you've got to go to the secretary for matters that shouldn't be the secretary's business. I'm sure in your department you didn't think that you had to do that kind of job if you were doing your job well. And my guess is you made enough noise with the people who worked for you that that wasn't necessary. So, but here's the problem we have and why I think, why we are concerned about the fees and why I don't think it's simply an evasion of our privacy to find out the fees you get. The fees that the private developers have to pay you, the need for those fees was non-feasance to a certain extent at the bureaucracy. And to the extent that government is so structured that private developers have to reduce their profits by paying for something that in a well-run bureaucracy they would have had anyway. That's what you described. You gave them something that in a well-run bureaucracy they wouldn't have had anyway. To the extent that private developers have to pay you and other people to get them what they could have had anyway, that reduces the amount of government program over a longer run or increases the cost. And that, I'm, I'm sure you agree with that. I know in your fight for deregulation, you have said, if the government imposes higher costs on private individuals, it may not cost you in that case, but over any reasonable time period, it's going to hurt your program. Do we disagree? Congressman, at the risk of, uh, of uh, causing embarrassment to you we'll and your supporters support. and me and my supporters, we're in agreement on this right. issue. <laughs> well, the, the, I, I appreciate that because that, I think, is the context in which the chairman was legitimately asking you for the fees. In other words, we don't claim that you did anything illegal to get these fees, but the fact that those fees were necessary inevitably detracts from our ability efficiently to provide program. And that's, that's what we have to look at. And the second question I have is that um, I, I just want to get to what you did to earn the fees. Now, you talked about a lot of work for the 20000 on the Corinthian project in Puerto Rico. But on the Essex project, and you said that you thought Ms. Siegel mm -hmm. talked specifically correctly. Let me ask you, before you left the Interior Department, I mean, in your, in your pre-Secretary of Interior days, uh, did you do much housing work? No. So you never represented anybody before to get low-income housing? No. Okay. So you had no prior expertise in housing? None at all. Had you ever advised anyone how to structure a tax deal for, uh, for low-income housing or moderate-income housing? Not for, not for housing, no. Okay. So you had not previously been a housing expert. You'd been a, a lawyer and had run a foundation and knew a lot about the law, but not in the housing area. And as you understand, the, the tough questions are the specific ones as to how you syndicate a deal. Now, we asked Ms. Siegel what you did in this particular deal, beginning on page 34 of the transcript. Did he give you any advice about how to go about the construction work? Ms. Siegel, absolutely not. Did he give you advice about how to syndicate? Ms. Siegel, no. Did he give you advice about how to structure the deal legally? Ms. Siegel, no. Mr. Frank, so the only thing Mr. Watt did then, in addition to five months rent and five months secretarial work, which you provided to her, 
was to intervene on your behalf with HUD. That's our problem. The administration, well into its, into the second term, I believe this was, uh, or four or five years into the administration, was so bogged down that for what you say is a good project, developers had to pay $300,000, not all of which you kept, simply to get you to go to the secretary and in one meeting say, will you get somebody off his or her duff? That's why we are so distressed. Because that 300000 did not, in that particular case, burden the tenants, but it is part of the reason why we have not been able to get more housing built and part of the reason why we have a, a higher per, uh, per, per, per tenant cost. I mean, if it costs 1000 to $2,000, as you said, with the street value of, uh, of, of housing units um, from HUD, the developers knowing that, we then, not in the specific case, but in trying to induce people to put their capital as a matter of free choice into this program, have to add that in effect in, in, in a free market analysis, don't we? In the long term, yes. Yes. So uh, would you share our view that leaving aside the propriety of what you did or didn't do, you took advantage of legal situations. George Washington Plunkett said, I seen my opportunities and I took them. Um, <laughs> and you did. But the result was that $300,000 was paid out for something that should not have been necessary for one meeting, and that's our problem. Uh, I, under I, I'm not, I understand where you're going, uh, and willing to go with you there, basically. I think you show understanding of the project. The, and I, I want to get into this a little, because I think you've addressed the issue that uh, needs to be addressed. And it's a subject that can be easily demagogued. And I don't think we should. And you've allowed us to address it, and I think you've framed it well. So, Mr. Brock, let me, I apologize. I'll just interrupt you only one time. I've got to be honest with you. It seems to me that the facts we're dealing with here are so appalling that there's no need to demagogue it. We have just, and I mean this quite seriously, that when we have to do this, it, it so obviously cries out for, for, for both censure of that system and the people who ran it and for remedy. That, that's all we have to do. I would agree with that statement. But I feel I've been demagogued against. And I don't like that, as you can understand why I wouldn't. So I think you framed it fairly, Congressman. Uh, and that is the problem that the, the committee needs to focus on, the program. And uh, it doesn't do any good to demagogue a Jim Watt, although it's fun. Um, uh, <laughs> seldom does a single phone call make lots of money for people. If, if you could make money just making phone calls, we'd, be all, we'd all be on the phone call, on the phone making calls. If someone called me and asked for a contribution to the Democratic National Committee, I'd tell them they had the wrong number and hang up. We get phone calls from stockbrokers, from real estate people, from insurance, from all kinds of people trying to raise funds. And I hang up quickly because they're wasting my time and you know, it's not beneficial, it's not of value. So it's, it's what the telephone represents that makes a difference, and in my case, I've spent 25 plus years building a reputation of integrity and credibility and capability so when a friend of Jim Watt gets a phone call, he knows he's not going to be wasting his time and it's going to be of value and it's going to have merit. And so yes, I can do things because I've built that reputation. So you're not paying to get a telephone call. Well, you're paying a guy that has the reputation to get the job done. I appreciate that, Mr. Watt. And in a number of areas, I would say yes, you bought Jim Watt's determination, which is well known, his intelligence, his experience, if it was a case where someone was trying to get a project through where regulation was a problem and you were trying to get the regulation substantively changed, I think we would stipulate that you would be one of the best. But here, as you've acknowledged, you were being asked to go into a field that prior to being Sam Pierce's colleague in the cabinet, you had never been involved in. You were being asked to deal with a fairly complicated subject, tax syndication, etc. And what you did was simply to call on the relationship that existed because you and Sam Pierce had sat together in the cabinet and all he did was to single out your project for special attention. Not, he told us, in the sense that he said approve it, but you said to us, and you frankly ascribed a much more significant role to that meeting than he did, you say to us, nothing is happening there and therefore you drew on your personal relationship with Secretary Pierce which came out of a joint public service with no expertise and said, Sam, they made the wait too long. And he then had to go and pull that project out from the pile. 
And there's an additional problem here. I'm not denying that the project was a good one. But as the chairman pointed out, nobody knew, not you and not Secretary Pierce and not Judith Siegel, whether it was the priority one. The administration and the Congress had cut the funds. And so what we have is that the selection process was not the merit of the project. And as I said, in previous periods, we've had problems where people had to be uh, influenced to do bad things. Here we had to spend $300,000 to do a good thing. The problem we have is that it's like who was it uh, Melbourne said about the Order of the Garter, the thing he liked about it was there was no damn idea of merit connected with it. That in this case, yes, you clearly met the basic standards. No one says that this project was a waste of money, et cetera, unlike one in New Jersey, which we've heard about with Mr. Manafort. But the problem was that out of a scarce pot, your project, by paying $300,000 to you and your partner, won a competition that it did not seem to me it was based on merit. And that's what is distressing. And not only did it win it, but as we have agreed, it won it in a way that in the longer term added to the cost of doing any project. But, yeah, and, and that's a fair summary. But because there's an opportunity to misunderstand, let me amplify for just 30 seconds. My involvement did not increase the specific cost of that project, right. nor did it cre increase rents to the tenants of that project. And that's an important uh, I said that, Mr. White, in that particular case, I would agree. But by that process having to exist, as you as a good free market economist know, when the government imposes inefficiency on the private sector, ultimately, that's a cost to the consumers of the program. So over the, right. over the years, and I guess the last question I would ask you, you are a man of integrity, you say, and, and you've been very concerned with morality. I agree it was legal. But didn't it bother you to take $169,000 yourself and 131000 from your partner? Did your partner do anything in this? I mean, you went to the meeting. Did your partner give you a ride? The yeah. guy got the 131. What did he do? Look up the phone number? The, uh, <laughs> the, the partner gave me backup and support. But just to ask Sam Pierce, no, 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 if, no, let me know. No, I just want to no. respect to my question. <laughs> On the Corinthian thing, I can understand that because you said you had a lot of meetings. But your partner didn't introduce you to Sam Pierce. You must have bumped into him at the cabinet meetings. No, the... Uh, the facts are that I had many, 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 many meetings on the Essex project, but not with Sam Pierce. But with Ms. Siegel and with others. Because I had to be backed up. Well, I had to have, let me finish please. I had to have authority. I had to have knowledge. I had to have understanding so that when I made okay. the visit, I spoke with confidence and I would not have my reputation tarnished. And, it's, and because of that but, lifetime experience, Sam Pierce had a right to know that Jim Watt wouldn't be uh, delivering look, anything. Mr. But Watt, a good the problem project. I have with that is this, and I, you know, Ms. Siegel has said, and you've agreed, you didn't advise anybody in this about any of the tech aspects. You had to learn about it yourself. Except I must say, in preparing yourself with a lot of detail for meeting with Secretary Pierce, you showed a great excess of caution. I think you were in less danger yeah. of being asked specific <laughs> questions in that context than at almost any other time in your life. Um, the fact is, however, that you still were able to have him do something because of a prior relationship in the cabinet. And that's when we talked, you said, I said we would get back to influence peddling. You had influence with Sam Pierce because you had been colleagues, co-workers, you shared the sense of battle, et cetera. And that, rather than any expertise in housing, was worth $300,000 to a developer and got HUD to pick this project rather than that project. That's, that's the problem. May I respond? Sir. Uh, the spirit of what you're saying is absolutely right. I av avoid the use of the term influence peddling because I think it's a harsh partisan term used by Republicans and Democrats to describe someone uh, of the other party carrying out an activity. Uh, I don't think it adds to the body of knowledge or the understanding. It may make headlines, but it's harsh partisan politics. And uh, that's why I try to avoid the use. Use the word. If we're going to talk about the participation I had, uh, I, I worked long and hard to build this reputation that I have. Uh, for those of uh, those who want to play the partisan game and be harsh about it, they can use that phrase and pin it on me. Uh, I can pin it on others, and I'm not going to use the names because I think we don't add to the professionalism of, of this hearing, frankly, or of to the, the debate. And I think, uh, Congressman Frank, the exchanges we've had have been substantive. We've not had disagreement in concept, 
And when I said I want to get back to it, that's what I want to say. I don't think we add anything, Mr. Chairman, by, by using that term, and, and I'm not well, going to I, participate in that debate. I, I, I want to say, in support of my chairman, who I think has done a wonderful job here, we're clear about it. No one said a violation of the law. What we're saying is that people had to pay to get influence used on their behalf, and that's why we're here. We're not here because uh, people just want to make points. We are here because a program is being badly run, run as you agree, in a way that ultimately increases the cost to the taxpayers, and, and we want to make very sure that uh, this doesn't happen again. And, and it's, it's but, too easy to demagogue the issue. I'm, I'm the messenger. Uh, but and no, I'm, no, you. And I bring, I bring a message uh, that you're agreeing with, and I'm agreeing with you, well, and there's no need to bad mouth the messenger. Mr. No White, you weren't just the messenger. You, you, were the, you were a very direct participant. And I have to say, you, you came to Washington with a reputation as a critic of the old ways of doing things. I thought in much of what you said that you were correctly saying it's not just the law, but it's, there's a broader spirit. I, I have to say, some of us did not find your willingness to participate in this process, where your influence with Secretary Pierce rather than your expertise led to one project rather than another being picked out at a fairly high amount. Uh, that's not what I would have guessed, having heard your rhetoric and knowing your reputation prior to your leaving the cabinet. The, I was surprised and, and disappointed. Uh, if you believe in democracy, we accept the wisdom of Congress and live under it. That surprises me more than anything you've ever said. No further questions. I, meant, I don't know that the record will properly show, but I want the record to show I raised both hands and went. Well, but no, then I'm going to come for, back, Mr. White. Now, Mr. White, see, that's the inconsistency. Yeah. You are a great critic of the established ways and are not hesitant to say that they are ways that should be changed. That's but correct. when the chance to make $169,000 for one visit came up, that did not seem to be motivating you, that sense of criticism. Much, uh, Congressman <clears throat> Frank. Let me just comment on one aspect of your observations before I turn to my colleague from Connecticut. Uh, it was Secretary Jack Kemp who blew the whistle on this program and an inspector general appointed by Mr. Reagan, continued in office by Mr. Bush, who did the investigation. I think it's very inaccurate, Mr. Watt, for you constantly to hark back to the notion of partisanship. Jack Kemp, is a Republican in good standing. In writing to me about this matter, he said, in part, the Inspector General's audit indicated that the selection and allocation process for moderate rehabilitation funds in previous years was undocumented, ignored existing standards and regulations, and was based on the perception and reality and reality of favoritism and abuse. Do you buy Jack Kemp's characterization that there is a reality of favoritism and abuse? I'm not in a position to, to have, I've not even read the IG's report. Well, you are familiar with the topic we are discussing. Uh, as it relates to my activities, and in my activities, as the IG reports uh, indirectly, uh, there was no, and Congressman Frank and I just had the exchange on it, uh, there was no abuse, there was no illegality, ill can't even say the word, illegality, there's nothing done wrong. Now, you, that report that you're talking about relates to the program. I don't have control over the program. I don't have input under the program. I'm not responsible for the program. And I, I but you participated in the program. As all Americans participate in No, in all Americans didn't get $300,000 for getting the units. No, That's not, not quite specific, accurate. But uh, a member, a person, a member of Congress can be against a tax, a Reagan tax cut and still pay the lower tax rate even though he was against the tax cut and still be doing the right thing. So I, 
to be castigated on this situation is, is something that uh, I am merely be. asking you whether you agree with Secretary Jack Kemp's characterization. And I'm responding, I guess, my response to your question is, that, as I said earlier, I'm not in a position to pass judgment on it. Because? Because I'm not that intimately familiar with the report of the IG or the way the program is now being carried out. Well, how about your participation? I've responded program? to that, and I'll repeat again. My participation was legal, moral, ethical, and effective. And I'm very proud of my participation. I know you don't like me to use that word, but I am. And it, I've, I've taken an oath to tell the truth, and I am proud of it. And I have done what is moral, ethical, legal, and proper under the laws of this land, and we had good results. Congressman Shays. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Be, uh, thank you. I'd like to just yield to my colleague, Mr. Lukens, who had just requested that uh, he be allowed to answer and ask a question. I thank Congressman Shays. I have one question prompted a lot by um, uh, our colleague from Massachusetts. Question. I'd just like to put this in frame of reference if I can. The consultant fee for the total project, I understand, is 11 percent. Was that, to was it? No, it's less. It's about 2 percent on I'm the I'm talking about price. Landex's share. Then your, your part, the, developer. the developer's the developer. fee. And, and my share was about 2 percent. Now, had it been a real estate agent, it probably would have been about 7 percent, well, or a Wall Street guy would have been something else. So since I'm using Congressman Shea's time, I just want to try to put something in perspective. The total fee for development then was about 11 percent, I'm told, and I don't know this. And you received approximately two and a half percent. So uh, all I'm saying is, uh, of the total amount outside of government and the, the developer himself, uh, we're paying about 11 percent of the program. I'm trying to get a handle on the cost of the program. Yeah, I'll go back Siegel, to Mr. Shays, Mr. Shays, for one minute, if I could. Definitely yield. Ms. Siegel said that her profit was to be 11 percent, or the, the developer's profit, as it was spread out. That roughly two and a half percent was paid out in this fee. Uh, the point I would make is that we do some calculation. That meant that the profit was reduced by about 25 percent, and that's what I think is an unfair over the time imposition on the private uh, on the private developer. When the difference between an 11 percent return on your capital and an 8.5 percent return on your capital in this kind of a market could be the critical difference between deciding to go ahead and deciding not to. Yeah. Mr. Watt, um, I find this hearing absolutely fascinating and, and a bit painful as well. And I have to get beyond a certain point, at least I have to be extraordinarily open with you before I start to ask some of my questions. I have to tell you, you miss totally the point if you think the issue is whether or not you receive federal funds or not. This program had money that was appropriated, uh, that cost the government money, it was tax dollars appropriated. This program also had what I refer to as tax expenditures, tax credits, loss in federal money uh, that was an end, a benefit to various developers. There was lots of federal money involved on both sides. Whether or not you receive federal money to me is not the relevant point. It, 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 it centers on it's relevant, but not the key point. The key point to me is whether you were paid to influence the decision of government officials and did you have a unique advantage in doing this that other people who also had worthy programs or maybe more worthy programs didn't have? That to me is the key. And to me that fits every definition of influence peddling. Uh, you may not like the word because it's a bad word. It implies that it's the context, not the expertise and the talent that got the project accepted. And that's basically the testimony that we had of Ms. Siegel. She said to us uh, very bluntly, she said you were the right man at the right time. Uh, she said you had no technical background whatsoever. You have also said that. Uh, I am not saying to you, sir, that you broke the law. I am saying to you that this is a smelly system in which you were a participant. And you may be a very good man, but the question that evolves with this whole system that seems to work down here, when do good men stop being good because they participate in a system that just reeks? Now, what I'd like to ask you is... Clearly, for the record, you said you spent time on a lot of technical things. Your testimony to us is that you did not participate or did not have technical background. That still stands, doesn't it? So isn't, isn't, isn't the real issue that you were merely trying to decide who made the decision and how you could influence them to make what you thought very honorably was the right decision? Wasn't that really your job? That is not the case at all, Congressman. I'm glad you brought it up because we need to focus on that if that's been communicated. That is not the situation at all. I have testified repeatedly this morning that 
I came to the conclusion that the decisions were ma being made by the career employees and that the political appointees were not giving them direction and therefore we had paralysis. I've testified repeatedly this morning that I never contacted those who I thought were making the decisions, the career employees. The, what, what Judy Siegel did testify to was that she felt that this project would pass any competition, but there was no competition set up. But we are confident that it is a great project, and we're not afraid of competition, and we would do that. Uh, I did not influence the decision. I never contacted <coughs> the people that I thought were the decision makers. Yeah. And I've been, re I've been, okay. that, I've, I've that, tried to be clear on that. I, I, I can't even deal with that last point you made because your testimony is on the record here as to what you did. Let me just make a point to you, sir, that in the course of our investigation, we found out, much to our surprise, that when less money was appropriated to mod rehab, the Congress, rightfully so, said we can't spread it out to everyone because there won't be enough to have impact, so it's going to have to go to some areas more than other areas. Some are going to get all and some will get nothing. The first, one of the councils made a determination, therefore, because of this, and it was an incorrect ruling, and he didn't put it in writing, that there would be no regulations governing this project whatsoever. That was incorrect, but that's what he did, and he didn't even put it in writing. So now you have career employees who have no regulations to work with. But what did he say? What did this council say? It would be right in the very center. It would be right under, as discretionary funds, under the secretary. The career employees should not get the rap. The career employees did not have regulations. Let me finish. Did not have regulations to, to know how this program even worked. In fact, the public who was applying for this, and the housing authorities no longer had regulations, but how did it work? It worked because some key political appointees made the decision. You had a meeting with uh, Mr. Pierce. He helped make those decisions. You had a meeting with Deborah Gordine. She is in the very center of it. And astonishingly, and this is just a parenthesis, the IG didn't even want to get into her activities. And that, to me, just astounds me. But the bottom line is you did meet with the people who made the decisions. It wasn't the career people. It was the political people. And regrettably, in this case, they happened to have been Republicans. But I'll say this to you. The program worked badly when there was no money in the program, and it worked badly when there was lots of money in the program, even under previous administrations. HUD has had a problem for a long time. We've all known it. Now, I'd like to go through some specific points with you because I want to have on the record your relations with certain people. I need to know uh, this not just because of your testimony and what I learned, but how I can approach my questions to some who follow after you. I would like to ask you in particular, when you met Judy Siegel, Judith Siegel. Congressman, may I have the privilege of responding you to your comment? You definitely may, and then I'll go to that question. Uh, I, want, I want the record to show that you and I have a disagreement on this subject, and I may, I may not know uh, all that I should know coming to that. I thought that uh, the council, and I, I watched on television a replay of it, I thought they were talking about fair sharing regulations. I don't know much about those, but let me assure you that there are many specific regulations with regard to what costs are eligible for inclusion in the mortgage payment. There are many regulations with regard to rents, and the career employees do have regulations, they do have standards, and they are being applied, <coughs> and that is my understanding, uh, and it's my belief, and I think what you're talking about is the fair share dimension as to the allocation well, of funds but, between the states. But it's important for you to know that the fair share, uh, which says what housing authorities get, you know, that each get a certain amount, that was the basis for determining uh, that a housing authority had so many units. But then... Yeah, I think that, that's my understanding. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> I mean, you're not this naive that you wouldn't realize now that it wasn't being worked that way. Certain housing authorities got projects and certain didn't. And you have said it. And, you know, I was listening to to my distinguished chairman, who I think has been extraordinarily bipartisan and nonpartisan, I listened to him and I thought, you know, he should just let you speak because you're digging yourself deeper in, in a hole. When you <laughs> said, when you said, I got the going rate, 
The street knowledge was it was a thousand to two thousand dollars a unit. Well, there was a reason, because not all the housing authorities got a little something. Only certain ones got it, and it was only those who had a developer or someone like yourself who made sure that those individuals, those housing authorities, got those units. And it just happened to be a nice coincidence that there was a developer waiting to do that project. In my own city of Bridgeport, I had a developer come up to me, and he's happy to say it on the record, that one of the people who testified to him said, I can get you 200 units, or 300, whatever, but a number of units in Bridgeport. All you have to do is pay me $1,000. Now, Ms. Siegel, who I started to ask you about, testified that you were the right person at the right time. And she was very candid. She couldn't meet with the decision maker. She knew how the system worked. It was the political people making the decision, not the career. It was never intended by the political people that the career people make the decision. The political people wanted to make the decision. She got you to go to those individuals. What did she mean you were the right person at the right time? Um. Since you, let me just say, since you testified that you had no technical experience. Congressman, I'm not on trial here. I'm not digging myself a hole. I'm just telling you the way it is. Uh, I'm not here to defend the system. So I've, I'm not a party. The system is flawed. We've talked about that. No, I definitely would, yeah. A minute ago, you said everything you did, you said it was legal. We accept moral. that. You then said it was ethical. Yeah. You said it was moral. Yeah. In other words, what you were doing was moral, even though the system was wrong and should be changed. Is that, is that your statement? The system was paralyzed. No, it was more than paralyzed. It was a lousy system. You well, just said so. It ought to be changed. Was it moral what you did? Absolutely. Why? Because Why is getting $300,000 to help build a project that someone else might have built moral? Now, come on. Come on. Okay. John, Connecticut I, yield I'm further? I'm happy to yield back. To say, to say the system is terrible, but what you did was moral on a high plane, not just what happened, not just it was regrettable that what happened, but was moral, I don't think you've learned a thing from this. Let me just say, I, I do yield to Mr. Morrison. I just want to make sure that you're able to make whatever comment you want. Um. Well, I, you said the system was paralyzed. Um, it wasn't that the system was paralyzed. It was that the system worked on influence. And if the influence was applied, then that project moved forward. To describe it as paralyzed, as if this were some bureaucratic logjam among the career bureaucrats is just to, if you think that that's true then you don't know what you're talking about and we have all the evidence in the IG's report to the contrary and secondly your statement about the career people applying regulations the selection regulations were all suspended as the gentleman from Connecticut pointed out the technical questions of the permissible costs you are correct were applied although from Mr. Knapp's testimony you wouldn't know why since he suspended all the regulations for this program. So all selection regulations, as the gentleman from Connecticut pointed out, were suspended, not just fair share, but criteria for selection. And that is what you participated in. You had no expertise whatsoever with respect to eligible costs. That's not why you were hired. You participated in selection. There were no regulations for selection. There was no paralysis. There was influence. You had influence. You got paid for your influence. That's the name of this program. You don't like calling that influence peddling. It's called influence for sale if you don't like peddling. But it, you sold influence, and that's why your project was approved. Just that the gentleman yield. I think what the gentleman has done comes not quite, but close to the great works of Albert Schweitzer and Mother Teresa. Hi. I just want to make sure you, if you want to respond, you may. And I just, but I, I thank you, Congressman. I, uh, I, even though what both gentlemen said may have sounded fairly harsh, if I could say it more tenderly, I feel the same way. Um, uh, the, the the problem was that that there was a polar, it was paralyzed only for the people who were trying to follow the system the way it was intended to work, 
under the regulations which many didn't know had been eliminated. And it was not paralyzed for people who were able to get someone with influence. And um, I'm not going to dispute with you whether or not what you did was moral or not, right? at least right not, not right now, because I think there are other points that are more important. Um, and you aren't on trial, but the system is, and all the participants uh, have had a role to play in this system. The bottom line for me is it was paralyzed because the regulations had been eliminated without it being public knowledge, and Judy Siegel, who, who was a very fine witness, uh, and she smiled a lot, said some very devastating things. And she said that she basically hired you because you were the right person at the right time, and I just need to know what made you the right person at the right time. Well, uh, Judy and I had become, to answer your first question, when did I get to know her? I got to know her in about 1984. Let me just say, I just know her from her testimony. I don't know her personally. She's a, she's a fine woman. Uh, I got to know her in about 1984. She worked with Phoenix Associates, and I got to know her through 84, 85, and uh, then in 86, uh, she moved her offices into my suite, uh, and we worked on a host of different uh, projects, including the Essex project, but not limited to it. Um, so you worked on a number of projects, and she worked in your office. Yeah. Um, tell me your relationship, and, and, uh, and I, I have to tell you that I, I, I do need to know what some of those projects are, but I will come back to that. Joseph Strauss, what was, what was your, when did you meet him, and what was his relationship? I met him in early 1984, and he had Phoenix Associates, which was a firm of, I don't know, a dozen, 15, 20 people. <coughs> Uh, you don't know the other members of the firm? Uh, I, don't, I don't know the number. Oh, yes, I know some of the members. Okay. Could, okay. I don't, I'm telling you, I don't know how big the firm was, how, how yeah. the number. Is. Uh, and uh, I worked with him with, on a variety of projects, and including the, the, the few I've mentioned here that had to do with, with HUD. So you worked on other projects with other government agencies, not, not HUD, but other government agencies? Uh, not other government agencies, but other real estate ventures and investment opportunities and projects. It wasn't just limited to HUD. Uh, Phoenix Associates, we talk uh, as if it is one person. It's, it's Joseph Strauss and a number of other people. That's Who were some of the other principal partners that you uh, worked with? Bob Gould was, I think, his general counsel, G-O-U-L-D. Um, he had... Uh, Several that worked on uh, different types of projects uh, that I didn't, wasn't so UDAG type projects, uh, uh, conventional type projects. Okay. Joe and Bob were the two, one, the two that I worked most effectively with. Now, we talked about three projects, and uh, I have, uh, the way I can see things and the way it's helpful for me is just to be able to visualize it. Uh, I want to know the name of each of these three projects to start with, and I want to know where they were. The Corinthian uh, and you've mentioned one or two, but I want you to put them all down in order and make sure I have them all. Okay. Corinthian Towers is in New Jersey. I think that that's 271 units. Okay. And it was initiated in the mid-70s, late 70s. And it, and it succeeded. The project is an ongoing concern. Very good project. Okay, uh, the uh, next project, uh, the second project? The, uh, the second project that I worked on was a Puerto Rican project called uh, Vista del Mar. Vista del Mar? Yes. Okay. And it's Puerto Rico. The third project is the Essex, pro the Essex and project. And how many units? I think about 300 units. Okay. And the third one? And the third one is uh, in Maryland, Essex, Maryland. And what was that project? 312 units. And the name of it? It's called Essex, Maryland. That's what it was called. It was in Essex, well, and the project well, was called Well, I think Essex. It's, uh, it's had a couple of different names. Kingsley Park, Ber okay, okay. Berkeley something. Now, it's the uh, Essex, Maryland were there other, any other projects besides these three? Those are the, the ones that I had the lead on. And there were other projects uh, that Phoenix Associates had other projects. And, and I testified the fact I went to that one meeting that dealt with uh, a host of projects, but I didn't have the lead, and I don't remember any of their names. Were you involved in uh, helping to acquire the units for any other than no. these three? No. These are the only three. So in your relationships with the other projects, it wasn't 
uh, the influencing aspect of getting someone to at least listen to it and see if it had merit to see if it should be funded. Uh, Is there any other? I, I only saw Secretary Pierce on two of them. Uh, we did everything we could to try to get uh, those things through. I never met with anybody else. The, the Vista Del Mar project, you, is that where you received 20,000? Is that the one you received 100? The Corinthian Towers. Corinthian Towers, you received 20. Uh, the Essex, you received 360 or whatever, the, the total right. amount. And the uh, Puerto Rican project, you received 20, 100. Thank you. Um, I just want to explore a little bit your relationship with the Phoenix Associates. What did they do to get the balance of the 300,000? They, they were the, they had brought the technical support and the competency uh, from the financial and technical ends, understanding the many rules and regulations that any project did have to meet. Uh, and uh, they gave me the, the authority and the strength of competence to uh, to represent that particular client. Um, specifically with UDAI grants, are you, is your testimony here today that you in no way tried to influence uh, any government official to, uh, to look favorably on a UDAI grant? That's correct. Okay. And your testimony is that you, uh, other than these three projects, did not attempt to influence any government official for any other project. Is that your testimony? Uh, those are the three that I sought to get to Section 8 Mod Rehab okay. units for. Uh, yeah, but it, it, I, I thought that you were also saying to me that you did not use your influence and your contacts to get any other projects or influence. I've testified that I went to the meeting with, uh, with, uh, with a Phoenix associate in Deborah Dean's office. And uh, I may have tried to set up other meetings uh, with uh, Judy or somebody okay. from Associates on other projects, but I didn't have a lead, and I never contacted and talked so, to them about so, it. So you're, you're, but, but you had a role to play in setting up meetings for Judy Siegel or Joe Strauss of Phoenix Associates to have some contact with someone. Another, See, I was a member of the team. No, I understand. And, and a business associate in lots of right, lots of activities, not just these three. Well, did you make? Uh, any profits from Phoenix Associates? Forget the direct payment. Did you? Did they say you contributed to so much income, and we're going to give you? Did you receive money from Phoenix Associates? Yes. Uh, can I ask you how much? Uh, it, Over the course of your relationship with them? I don't. I don't have those figures with me. You know, what we were involved. But in do you other... understand why that's pertinent? I mean, you know, you can get money directly from from the government. Uh, excuse me, directly from the developer. The payments goes directly to you. But you could be involved, as you've pointed out, in setting up meetings and doing some other and things. And securing clients. Securing giving clients. Counsel, giving counsel and advice on strategies mm -hmm. and the like. Could you give me a ballpark figure? Is it, uh, is it hundreds of thousands of dollars? Is I, it, wish, I wish to work. <laughs> no. you, is your testimony that, it, that any, not, any money that you received from Phoenix was less than 100000 i I'm not prepared to discuss that amount now. Well, you I know, just didn't bring the figures with me. Uh, let me say to you that <laughs> I know where I get my money from, and I know where I don't get it from. And is it your testimony that you sincerely don't remember, or that you simply don't think it's any of my business? It, it, it's, uh, it is that I didn't bring it with me, and I don't have those figures on the top of my head to give you. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that you would not be able to give me the specific amounts, but um, unless you're an extraordinarily wealthy person, you could basically break it down in chunks of 100000 or so. Would it be your testimony that you received an income from Phoenix during the, your relationship with them more than 100000 Uh We then get into a debate over, over what was... If that's critical to the committee, I pledge to cooperate. Well, I would ask that that be done in executive session. I don't think it's necessary to put this out in the public arena if it's critical. I don't know that... I don't even understand that it's critical, Congressman. Well, I'll tell you why it but is. But if you think it is, I pledge well, to be cooperative, and I don't feel that we need to splash Jim Watts revenue all over the country. To some people, it'd be huge. To others, it'd be paltry. You know, I've done my best, and uh, if that's critical to you, well, and let if me you just folks think it is, I'll make it available, but I would, I'm not prepared to do it today. And okay. I would ask that I be given some well, privacy let, on this Let matter. me say this to you. I'm, I'm happy to talk with the chairman about it. I would like that, that given to him, and we would let you know beforehand whether that has to be public knowledge or not. I just, that would be a decision that the chairman would have to decide. Uh, the reason why it's important is that, that 
Joe Strauss and Phoenix Associates aren't just some individuals. Joe Strauss worked in the department. He was a government employee who had a very significant role in, in HUD. Who, who then decided to leave HUD and has made uh, significant amounts of money in his relationship to HUD. And what we're trying to discover is why is the system working this way? What can we do to improve it? And uh, to really know who were the key players were. Um, for instance, uh, my judgment, Tom Demery uh, is not the key player. Uh, and I know the papers think he is, but he's not. And, and has he been involved in some wrongdoing? He may have, I don't know. But he, he, in my judgment, has played a minor role uh, in terms of getting to the person you met with. Why would you have met with Deborah Gordon? She's just the executive assistant to, uh, to, the, um, sec to the secretary. I mean, Are you she, asking why I would yes, meet with her? Yes. Why, why would you have wanted to meet with her? And uh, in, in, in case there's confusion about that, uh, I met with her on the phone or in person on more than the one time as I testified. When I would go to meet Secretary Pierce, I would let her and others know what I was going to meet about, and then I would tell them what I met and what it was done to keep everybody informed so that things could get done. Right. Things get done through people. And I was trying to inform the system of, of what was going to happen so the Secretary would not be blindsided. And, uh, and so I met with her more than the one occasion. It was that I was going into his office waiting. I'd, I'd have conversations. You see, if, so she, if, she was kept up to date on what I was going to talk to Secretary Pierce about. Okay. And the fact that you were interested in mod rehab. Mm -hmm. I told her what I was going to talk to him about. The, 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 the fact is, if you read the IG's report, you'd really read nothing about Deborah Gordine, and yet if you, you read how the system really worked, you'd know that she was at very front and center. In fact, we even had the um, Secretary say that, you know, if she did things, she did it without his consent, and maybe she went beyond her her responsibilities. She says, according to the Wall Street Journal, that um, talking about this system, and I'll read you the paragraph, it said, at least one former HUD official, Deborah Gordine, makes no bones about how the program was won. It was set up and designed to be a political program. I would have to say we ran it in a political manner. And I guess uh, for my first line of question, I, I probably would only have one more line. Uh, I just have to say it was a political program they got a very, uh, political people were the ones that made the system work regrettably, uh, as honorably as you may have done it, regrettably, you were what was necessary to unlock the key. Uh, and uh, people in HUD, uh, who were in HUD, then became key players when they got out of the system. And they made a lot of money in the process. Um, and if, if the cost of doing business is a thousand or two thousand dollars a unit, um, to secure those, those units, uh, I have to say to you that um, uh, it, it just uh, astounds me that um, everyone, including yourself, wouldn't find that reprehensible. I might just volunteer in the contacts that I had with Deborah Dean. Uh, I found her to be very professional. I didn't know about uh, any, of, any of the things you've suggested with me. She was very professional and uh, I felt uh, whatever she said, I don't remember anything specific, but I never got any impressions that she was other than perfectly loyal and uh, to, this, to Secretary Pierce and, and did everything properly. I have no reason to suspect any of these things. She, the ironic thing is you wanted to see Secretary Pierce and it may have been you saw the right person you saw without Deborah knowing Gordine it. Yeah. <laughs> because, because she served on the panel. Is it your testimony you didn't know that she served on the panel? I never, I heard of the panel when I saw the videotapes of your, quite your, the committee's mm -hmm. questioning of Secretary Pierce. I'd never heard of such a yeah. thing. Well, it just raises a question then. If you were aware of that, how could you blame the career employees uh, when, when the testimony that we've had makes it very clear that it was taken away from the career employees and Be given to the political? Because I've sworn to tell the truth as I saw it and understood it. I never knew about a panel. What I started working on was Corinthians Towers, which had been in the process for a long period of time. When I talked to Barksdale, I'm repeating, when I talked to Barksdale, the problem was that the career employees hadn't reviewed and applied the allocations and application and applied the, excuse me, applied the regulations to the Corinthians Towers project, and it was trying to get them to make the decision because he wasn't going to. Well, I'll, I'll close the second yeah. time then with just making a comment that uh, 
uh, I have met some tremendous career employees who were simply not allowed to do their job because the political people got in the way. And I pray that one of the outcomes of this is that we revamp HUD in its entirety, uh, that hopefully more money will go to HUD to be spent in, a, in an effective way, um, and that the morale of this agency uh, uh, is able to improve. And I would parenthetically say, I hope to God we don't lose Jack Kemp because I think he's on the right track. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So well, as much as you dislike the term itself, uh, since it is a part of American language, uh, would you give us your definition of influence peddling? Well, I, uh, I kind of already have. Uh, to repeat, uh, the term influence peddling is a partisan phrase used... No, 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 Tell me what, I, what the definition of influence peddling is without the characterizations of partisanship or nonpartisanship. Tell me what, what, it, what it is in practice. How, what, what do you understand it to be? I can only, I only see it used and have only used it in a partisan attack. So that's, I, if you don't want me to defend it, define it in that frame, I, that's where I've heard it and that's the way I have used it. And, and in the partisan fashion, how is it defined in your mind? It's when one of the Republican Party or Democrat Party yes. accuses someone else yes. of using his credibility or whatever right. to gain an objective. And you believe that it exists, do you not? Of in course. In our society? Right. And within the context of that definition, given how you described your work, wouldn't you say that your work, in fact, fits that definition? Uh, my credibility uh, was used mm -hmm. to get a result. Right. Therefore, you engaged in influence peddling. If I were a Democrat, I would say that Jim Watt engaged in influence peddling. And if you were an objective Republican, would, would you also believe no. that that was a... No, I would say there's a skilled, talented man who used his credibility oh, to accomplish oh. an objective. Morally. Morally and ethically. That, by definition, is also yeah. there. So that, so that any Republican who thinks that you engaged in influence peddling is, is what? Nonpartisan. No, well, if Mr. Shays, for example, as he has said, considers what you've done to be influence peddling, and he's not a Democrat, how would, how would that fit into your definition? Uh, I try not to use the term. I know that. And so I try to, I don't, you know, does this go to the objectives of what I was called by the chairman to testify? If it does, uh, I guess I don't, I come up short. But it is, it is therefore possible for members of one's own party to accuse one of influence peddling. Isn't that correct? Of course. I've been accused yes, of a lot right. of things. Yes, right. Okay. That, that, that's good to know. Okay. Now, tell me how long uh, were you associated with Phoenix Associates? Since early 1984. From 1984 to when? Well, to, to now, I guess. You're still associated with that? Well, we aren't doing any projects today, but uh, we have never terminated. You know, it's an informal situation. Well, now, wait. I, I thought that you testified earlier that you were back in Jackson That's Hole That's and correct. you don't do any, any work at all. Uh, you don't have any clients. That's right. Legal or housing or consultants or anything else. That's right. Okay. When did you stop doing active work for Phoenix Associates? We, we have not taken on a new project since I left Washington in, 80, in May of 86. Is Phoenix Associates now out of business? Has it terminated? No. Do you receive compensation or dividends or any kind of monies at all from Phoenix Associates? I did this year uh, already a check on the Puerto Rican project that I've testified to. See, these projects take years for payout, so the association continues. I've been involved with Phoenix Associates for six years. Uh -huh. Okay. And, and the payments I've received have been through that period of time. Okay. And, and could you tell us what the total amount of money that you received, either by way of projects, as you've described them, or for any other purpose because of your work with Phoenix Associates from the beginning in 1984 
to, to this date? I have responded to that uh, for the, in the chairman's question, and I've given the amounts on the three projects. Yes. And uh, I have received some additional money, and I have not testified to those amounts. And I just asked you if you would please tell us how much, in fact, you've received and, in total. And uh, I've talked to Congressman Shays about that, and I, I think there's some privacy that a private citizen ought to have. I will cooperate with the committee. Well, I, I hate to tell you this, Mr. Watt, uh, but in the context of the investigation inquiry that has been conducted, which has full legislative justification, there is no right of privacy to withhold information which the committee considers relevant. And so okay. I'm asking you, for the record, to tell us what, in fact, you received as total compensation in any form whatsoever from Phoenix Associates. Mr. Chairman, that request has been made of me before with, by Congressman Shays, and I've responded in that way, and I will be cooperative on it. Uh, it's, Mr. Watt, it's a perfectly appropriate question, given the context of this investigation. Your testimony earlier was that you don't have the figures here with you. Uh, can you respond to uh, the question by Congressman Weiss in terms of orders of magnitude? Uh, I could supply it uh, for the record. Mr. Chairman, if, if, if you insist upon it, I would like it to be, uh, I'd like some privacy if, on it. Uh, I would ask that it be done as, I'm not sure the right word I need to use here, but I would ask that it be held confidential by the committee members, if, if that's appropriate. Uh, in past hearings, I've had that type of thing done. Uh, we didn't just smear all those things in the public arena, and I think that uh, that's not an unreasonable request for a private businessman to make of a congressional committee, and I have made that the request to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, number one, uh, if, if the committee determines it to be relevant, then I will back off. Well, it's relevant by the very nature of two colleagues uh, on okay. both sides of the aisle having asked you this. Okay. We okay. will allow you, Mr. Watt, to submit it for the record next week, and we shall take under advisement your request with respect to uh, keeping it confidential. I may need that answer first, Mr. Chairman. Well, you may be directed to answer that. And uh, that may be the cleaner and neater way to it, do it. It may be. It may be the cleaner. I, if, if I could, I'd like to talk to you about it. But uh, you may. I'd be you. happy to do so. I wouldn't think you were to do it. Of course, I'd be pleased. To uh, it, it would be very helpful for us to know also the list of whatever projects you had an ownership in, either directly <coughs> or indirectly through Phoenix Associates. Um, and you don't have to. I won't ask you that. Well, I will. I would like to ask you. Uh, without going into the details, did you have any ownership in any, any HUD projects? Uh, either directly or indirectly through no, Phoenix Associates? We started out on the Essex project that way, and frankly, I didn't have the risk capital. And so we converted in the process, and the, so I ended up with no interest, and therefore I would have no equity interest in any of the projects. So, you're, you're, But I want to be very clear, since you are under oath, and I, I want to make sure that you are clear on what my question is. You have, you have no ownership uh, interest whatsoever in any HUD projects. That is correct. Whether they're rehab or, or, or UDAG or whatever. That's okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Um, could you tell us if the work of Phoenix Associates involved work other than that which related to federal housing programs? It did. What kind, what kind of work? We were involved in uh, trying to make uh, a host of different type of projects uh, come into being uh, from a project we worked in in Ohio to build a hotel, one in Virginia. We considered a waterfront project in one of the Carolinas. We worked on some apartment complexes in Florida and New York, I believe, and a variety of things. None of these HUD-related. And were there, were there federal involvements in any no, of them? No, no. Were conventional okay. type OK, things. now, uh, the chairman had referred earlier to the special agent for the uh, inspector general uh, who quoted you as having said that, in fact, the $131,000 uh, went to Mr. Strauss uh, for in, as a repayment for monies that you had owed him uh, on other matters. And it is, it is, is that your testimony 
that you never said that to that agent? Uh, I've tried to just correct the understanding of it. Uh, do I owe him when I am, have agreed to split fees? If that's owing, then I owe it. I no, 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 no. I, I, don't, mean, I don't mean on, on the specific matter, not on specific Essex project. I mean on other matters, because that's what the special agent's testimony or statement was. And I'm asking you whether, in fact, that statement by the speci special agent is an erroneous statement of what you told him. Uh, it doesn't sound like something I, there's, there's no need, it doesn't sound like something I would have said, because I would have talked about revenue sharing. Some of the things that, that he's said I said are just not characteristic of me, but they're not that big a deal, so I'm not making an issue of it. No, I, I know that you're not, but I'd like to know for, for sure whether, in fact, his written uh, transcript of what he says you told him is, in fact, accurate as far as you're concerned or not. It is uh, accurate enough in the spirit of the way we're going that I'm not going to contest it. And I thought I made that clear to the chairman. Well, were there, in fact, other matters than the Essex Project fee sharing on which you owed Mr. Strauss money for which this $131,000 was utilized? Uh, the answer to that is probably no. My best recollection of that is that uh, generally we would have uh, had, a, had a split, but he probably owed me some money, had not paid fully on some, some of the other things that we were doing, and that I deducted it from his share. Well, I notice that you're giving, you're giving me equivocal answers. I'm, and I, I'm not, I'm giving you my best recollection yes, of where I am. Well, you're saying probably, and it's not characteristic, and again, I think that it, it, it may be extremely important, given the explanation that you gave earlier, which was that you didn't have to report it on your income tax That's return right. because, in fact, whether you had, the, you had Ms. Siegel or the developer uh, funnel the mon monies directly to Mr. Strauss or give it to you and then you divide it, it was the same consequence for your tax return. That's right. You would agree, however, that the consequence would be quite different if, in fact, this was repayment of prior loans, additional, different loans, different monies that you would owe Mr. Strauss. Oh, this, okay, if I, I thank you. Yeah. No, this was just uh, fee-sharing arrangements. So, so that, so that the special agent's transcript of what you told him then is not accurate. Is that what you are telling us? Let's read it to be sure we know what we're fussing about here. Um, Would you, Mr. Chairman? May I help you, Mr. Walker and, uh, and my yeah. colleague? The special agent's report, the next to the last paragraph, reads as follows. What said the only money he received from the Berkeley project was $169,002 in three checks. He recalled that additional money was to be paid to him but instead it went to Joe Strauss because he, what, owed Strauss money, which was related to another venture in which they were involved. Okay, glad we did look at the record. It is not a quote. Uh, it's not a quote at all. And uh, the, the facts are that we split the fees, as it says, and that, I'm, that Joe may have owed me. It does not say that you split the fees. No, I'm telling you what the facts are. We did split the fees. Yeah. The special agent's report doesn't say that. The... I'm not sure where you're going. Last I'm, paragraph. Joe and I agreed to split fees. And uh, there may have been an adjustment on this particular agreement. And frankly, I'm not remembering the specifics of it at the time because of of other fees that uh, we may have split, and Joe still owed me some on the on those, so I may I, I probably or may have reduced uh, a 50-50 type cut to the 131. But we're talking about only the sharing of revenue fees from this project and maybe another project. Okay, so that so that in fact the special agent's transcript of what you said to him, which was that uh, 
Instead, it went, the additional money was to be paid, and instead it went to Joe Strauss because he, he what, owed Strauss money, Would have been which was related to another venture in which they were involved, is an accurate no. restatement by the special agent. Is that okay. correct? That is not correct, then. That I would not have owed Strauss more money, if that's what it's saying, because Watt owed Strauss. I did not owe Joe Strauss additional monies on other ventures. It may have been that he owed me money from past activities, but I did not owe him additional money. So, so be just because otherwise, otherwise you're saying, just so that the record is clear, because I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, I'm just trying to get a clear statement for the record. So what you're saying is that under the, the, the fee sharing arrangement was that you would divide it 50-50, is that correct? Generally, was that the fee sharing arrangement? Generally we did it that way, but not in, always. In this instance, was that the arrangement? That was the general concept as we started into it. Yeah. Mr. Watt, I, it's very hard, and this thing is going to go on intermin interminably, if we can't get beyond the general and get to the specific. In this instance, you received $300,000, and the question I'm asking you is, was Mr. Strauss entitled under your arrangement to $150,000 of that $300,000? I've testified to this as best I can, Congressman. Which is? which I've repeated time and time again. I know. Tell me, tell me now. Was he entitled to $150,000 of the $300,000? He was obviously entitled to $131,000 of fees that were, was directed to be paid to him, and, and they were paid to him. But was it only $131,000 rather than $150,000 because he owed you from prior amounts, or was it because the, sh the share of the $300,000 was only $131,000. The general approach that we took to it was that we would split the fees 50-50. As it unfolded, there may have been other adjustments because of, of revenue share fees that he shared with me on other projects that had to be adjusted out. And quite frankly, I'm telling you again, I don't remember the specifics. I'm doing the best that I can. Okay. Now, if, if the going, street, going price uh, on the street was a thousand or two thousand dollars per unit uh, and you received roughly that amount for on the Essex project why did you receive only twenty thousand dollars on the the project in New Jersey and a hundred thousand dollars in the project in Puerto Rico well <laughs> my partners and I have laughed about that since they said now Jim that you've learned what the what thing is I suppose you're going to bill us for additional additional revenues and uh, the answer is that's what uh, they offered and it sounded like a lot of money to me and uh, we settled on it. I Which came first? Did Essex come first or the New Jersey, New Jersey project? New Jersey was first. The New Jersey project. It's, and it's uh, one I broke my teeth on. Right? And on that one you worked a tremendous amount of time. You well, had I, would, I don't emphasize a tremendous amount of time, but a tremendous amount of contacts to get something done that shouldn't have had to be right. done by a guy like and, that. And how many units were involved in that? 271. And you got 20,000 bucks? Yeah. Did you share that with anybody? No, that was direct payment. That was to you from directly? From Phoenix Associates to me. Right, okay. And how about the, the Puerto Rican project? Was that the second or third project? That was, uh, I guess it was the second project I worked on, but I just got the check in 1989. Right. And how was that $100,000 figure arrived at? Um, I guess because I wasn't a good negotiator, but uh, that's what uh, my partners uh, offered up, and that's where we are today. And how much time elapsed between the beginning of the of the Puerto Rican project and the uh, new, and the Essex project, the Maryland project? Uh, I did basically Corinthians '84, Puerto Rican project '85, and the Corinthians and the Essex project in '86. And they came to you and said $300,000 on the, uh, on the uh, Essex project, having only given you $100,000 or agreed to give you $100,000 on the Puerto Rican project. There was no assurance that I'd ever get paid on the Puerto Rican project when right. I worked, started the Essex. There's no assurance that any of these things will right. ever go through. Right. And uh, we, we were working on lots of different projects, and it was an informal arrangement. And uh, you, know, you get a check on what you're working when the cash flow comes in, you get a check on 
on that issue and you're working on other things and maybe they'll come true. No, just general business. But I assume that you had the agreement up front. You didn't get, get, get the agreement as you went along. No, the, uh, the, the basic agreements start in and then you have to determine what your costs are yeah. and how, how that works out. I don't, you know, you, you like to make it, or I don't mean you personally, excuse me, but it, it's like to be a clean cut deal that the guy gets a big check for making a single phone call. That's not the way I worked on these things. I was an integral part of a team. We had litigation costs in uh, Puerto Rico. We had a lot of problems there, uh, flying back and forth there with my team members, lots of expense in that project. And we, after you syndicate it, then you see what your share are, share of profits will be after syndication because you make the money on the syndication, not on the HUD project. Okay, okay. Uh, in any event... Uh, and so it's still I'll, uncertain. And I'll, and I'll close on this. Uh, I, I was impressed by your statement, of Mr. Frank, about how uh, impressed and pleased you are that uh, poor people have housing which they desperately needed as a result of your efforts. Uh, you are aware of the fact that uh, during the course of the Reagan administration, the amount of support, federal support for housing, went down from somewhere around $25 billion, $31 billion, to somewhere around $9 billion a year. Now, I suppose that that, that distresses you, does it not? In well, retrospect? I have uh, learned not to be uh disgusted with what Congress does with appropriation requests. I know that the executive branch proposes and the legislative branch disposes. You're not aware of the fact that the Reagan administration went out to really cut back, uh, slash the, the federal housing programs? I'm aware of that, and I'm aware of that Congress has the final say, and Congress does what it wants to do. So it, you know, the, the uh, Congress appropriated the funds, not, the, not President Reagan. Well, I, I must say, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't think that the conversion from the old Watt to the new Watt is really complete. Uh, I, I think that, that uh, the, 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 well, chutzpah, I guess, is the, is the word that's most relevant, gore, perhaps, uh, if you are trying to suggest at this point that uh, you are unaware of the fact that it was the Reagan administration in which you played a very key and active role which went out to undermine most of the federal programs in existence. That, 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 that was all the work of, con of Congress. That's really very hard to credit to somebody who was such an active player as you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And just the incredulity of your answers on something as large as obvious that we're familiar with that Mr. Weiss has spoken about makes me doubt the rest of your testimony about things I don't know much about. Your credibility, at least in this gentleman's eyes, is next to, next to nothing right now. Do you believe it's a good thing or a bad thing that federal housing subsidies were cut from $31 billion to $9 billion, good or bad? You're okay, don't give me this stuff. Congress and this. He was asking you a question that now you've worked with housing programs, you were an active player in administration that slashed them. Should they be slashed? I think that we can have a more efficient housing. That's not my question. You don't want, I, my question is, was it a good thing that it went down from 31 billion to 9 billion, regardless of who was responsible? Mr. Chairman, my answer to his question is that I believe there could have been a more efficient and should be a more efficient system to deliver housing in this country. Do you think you helped make it more efficient by your actions? We took a program that does exist and we, under the terms of that program, brought into existing good housing units. Yeah. Uh, let me read to you a quote from you, okay? You warned us warned America of, quote, being lured by the crumbs of subsidies, entitlements and giveaways, lured into a deep, lured deep into the forest of government controls and regulations. Those are your own words. Do you still believe them? I think those are good words. Do they apply to you? They should apply to us. Uh, the Do they country. apply to you? I'm part of the country. 
Do they apply to your actions in, with Phoenix Associates on these three projects? Were you lured by the crumbs of subsidies, entitlements, and giveaways lured deep into the forest of government controls and regulations? If our desire, if our desire, which it was, was to create housing, we had to work within the system that exists. We effectively worked within that system, system with the governor of Maryland, with the state of Maryland, with the county of Baltimore, to bring about a neat, good project. Were you lured into the, I'll ask the question again. Were you lured by the crumbs of subsidies, yes or no? You're not answering any questions. Were you? I mean, here you are, and you know, everyone else in this room, everyone else in this room sees the hypocrisy of what you have done. And you're not, you're just bringing more on yourself. You call it a moral action. You're saying you are very compassionate and glad that housing was built for poor people. That was your record a few minutes ago. It's a direct contradiction in what you stood for in your public life. I don't mind people making changes, but when confronted with new realities and new changes, you may have learned something when you did this housing. You may have learned something. But when confronted with those, you simply try to say there is no contradiction in what you said and did before and what you've said and did after, you're not being honest, either with yourself or with this committee. It's one of the two, it can't be any other. I'll ask some specific questions too. Uh, first, seems to me kind of strange the way you negotiated your fees. You didn't ask how much time or effort they would involve. They said $20,000, yeah, I'll take it. They said $300,000, yeah, I'll take it. And in fact, the one where you made $20,000, you testified you did far more work than the one you did $300,000. Did you ask when you negotiated these fees how much work it would entail? I had a, I thought at the time I had a full understanding of the concepts that we would pursue. As it turned out, in the first instance, I had no understanding okay. of, of how bad this, the handling of the Corinthian Towers had been and would continue to be. Okay. So it was a learning curve for me. Okay. Did you ask when you were asked the second fee, when you were offered the second fee, how much work it would entail, having learned what you learned on Corinthian Towers? I, I asked lots of questions because uh, I was putting my credibility on the line. Right. Did you ask, but I asked you, did you ask how much work it would entail? And Mr. Chairman, yes. I, find, I find him not answering my que any of my questions directly, and these are questions that are right directly on point. You did ask how much work it would entail. What were you told and by whom? I simply uh, don't remember, wouldn't try to remember. Uh, you don't remember. You know you asked the question, but you don't remember the answer. If I tried to recreate it, you would uh, get after me because I wasn't an exact quote, and so I'm not. I'm not asking for an exact quote. I'm asking for some proximate answer, which you so far failed to give. And I find it very, very, very uh, strange that you would remember asking the question and then you would have no recollection whatsoever of the answer. We talked about in every one of these projects what had to be done, what were the tax consequences that drove the project, how would we frame the syndication. Did you ask what your role was? I asked my, my role and I'm, it would you, Congressman, if I'm trying my best to answer your question. Well, I hope you are. And I hope you'll allow me to. I will if you answer the questions. Well, I can't when you're talking. Good. Well, let's, so, now let's hear the answer. So I was involved in those processes in the broader context. I also asked, what do we have to do with the state public housing authorities? What do we have to do with the county or the local? And what do we have to do with HUD? And we went into it with the best understanding that we could, recognizing that 
that some would be easier than others and that the clients were, were very insistent upon this and that they didn't want to be paying an hourly bill because sometimes these didn't turn out. They didn't want to pay by the hours. The hours were not important. It was results that were important. So in other words, they would have been just as happy had it taken you one hour or 500 hours. That's right. How many hours did you spend approximately on, on the Essex project? I never kept any records on hours. Just an approximation. No and one's holding you to a direct exact number of hours, minutes, and seconds. I, I have no, I've never Did worked. you make more than 10 phone calls? I spent the time that was necessary with the team of players to work through the complexities that we had in the thing. No, I but I, I'm not concerned about how much internal work, education work that you did. That was substantial. I understand that. But if I were a developer, that would be a cost to me, not something to pay you for. What I'd be paying you for in this system of non-influence, non-peddling is uh, is is what you would do after my, all of my associates educated you, right? Because it doesn't benefit the developer that Mr. James Watt is more educated about housing projects if he's not going to do a thing on the outside. So how many phone calls did you make to non, to government officials approximately? HUD officials, State of Maryland officials? On Essex? On Essex. Did I, you deal with State of Maryland officials directly? You're, you? I, I did not directly. Did you deal with County of Baltimore officials? No, my partners did. But you did not? That's correct. Did you deal with HUD? I dealt with Secretary Pierce as I've testified. You, now, with Secretary Pierce, you testified that you had one half hour meeting where he says you talk mostly about other things and just mentioned this project. You say you went into a nice detailed explanation of the project. Did you do anything, did you talk to any other people in HUD about this project other than Secretary Pierce? No. Well, y yes, I've already testified. I, I kept the Deborah Dean and the Housing Commissioner or acting, whoever it was. Well, what not. you testified to is before you met with Secretary Pierce, you called each, I and think let, you named four people. And let them know you what You called I, each of them to know you were meeting with Secretary Pierce. And told Pierce. them afterwards I'd done it. That's right. Is that all you did on this that, project? That's correct. Okay. That that it would be fair to state that you spent no more than five hours on the project then? That would be wrong. Go ahead. Five hours dealing with outside HUD officials. No, with, with HUD. With I, HUD officials. Congressman, it, I, I've not quantified any well, time. Well, here's what you've quantified to me. A half hour meeting with Pierce, four phone calls to four other HUD officials saying that you were meeting with Pierce, Four phone calls to HUD officials or, saying you had met with or, Pierce. Or, or meetings, yeah. Communications, right. Right. That's it. With HUD. Yes. With HUD. That's right. Okay. What other governmental agencies did you work with? No other governmental entities. Okay. Who else did you talk to about this project other than people within the developer, you know, within the family oh. of the developer, Deborah Siegel and is it Deborah? Judith. 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 Sorry. Oh. Judith Siegel. Uh, all the Phoenix Associates people, etc. Who no, other? None other. Just the developers and, and, the, and the partners. Okay. So I would submit, it's pretty clear on the record, Mr. Chairman, that for one half hour meeting and eight phone calls, each of which were described as perfunctory, That's correct. Mr. Watt got $169,000. Is that correct? No. Okay, well, you can go ahead and explain why it isn't. No, 131 went to the other. No, 131 was the guy who made the phone call. Right. Go ahead. Well, what is your question now? My question is, since you, by your own statement, were hired because of your credibility, and you could go talk to government people and use that credibility, and since by your own statements here in the record, you spoke to Secretary, Wa uh, Secretary Pierce for a half hour, made four phone calls before, 
four phone calls in the after, which I would characterize by your testimony as perfunctory in nature, because by your testimony you were simply letting them know you were meeting with the secretary and then simply letting them know that you had met with the secretary, that you, it would be hard that you spent at most, assuming each of these phone calls took an hour, uh, you would most spend 10 hours doing anything to earn this hundred, doing what you were hired to do for this. And I would submit, Mr. Chairman, that the reason there wasn't terribly much negotiation, and, the, and, the sec and Mr. Watt can't remember how, if there was discussion about what he would do, is because it's in all likelihood it was said, you just make a call or a couple of calls, you'll get the pro and we'll have a good shot at getting the project. That's what any outside observer, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, Northeast, Southwest, would judge. Now, why don't you rebut what I had to say? I want to give you the full time to rebut it. I simply don't agree with you, and I don't feel a compulsion to rebut. No. I'll let my statement measure up by yours. And I'd be pleased with that comparison. Fine. Okay, let me ask you some other questions. Just again, Deborah Gordeen, how did you know to call her? I first went over and met her when I was going with an associate from Phoenix Associates. But how did you know? Here you have this, it's, uh, what year did you first meet with her or talk to her, 84? Probably 1984. Okay, here you have this huge building, this nice curvy HUD building. There are thousands and thousands of people in it. How did you pick her? I... The associate told you to go to her? No, I went with him. Right, so the, who was that associate? It's a, it's a, a Phoenix associate to member. Who was it? And I, it was either Joe Strauss or Bob Gould. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, I don't think anyone on this committee is saying you have to have a pinpoint memory. If you're making an effort to answer the questions, we appreciate it. If you're making an effort not to answer the questions, at least I don't appreciate well, it. That time you made an effort to answer the question. I don't care. Well, I smile because I don't know the answer in that I thought it was Joe, and both Joe and Bob say it was Bob, so it was probably Bob. Okay. And what did he, either, whoever it was, Bob or Joe, say to you about Deborah Gordine? Why were you meeting with her? She was, they, they had a series of problems that are the more technical type that, that I didn't get involved in, and they needed the paperwork that was already submitted to HUD by the public housing authorities and had been there for some period of time. They needed to get that reviewed to see that it did meet the regulations that did exist and continue and continued to exist and get those papers either rejected or approved so that they could redo them if necessary or approve them as, as the you, process. Did you after that call her on how many occasions? I, I Deborah Gordeen. After that, I mean, in your whole association with Phoenix Associates did, and Housing, how many other times did you deal with Deborah Gordine? To my to recollection, to my recollection, right. just the times before and after going to the two times I went to see Secretary. Okay. And the, the objective, I don't know if I, I want to be responsive. I'm not sure what. No, please. The, Go ahead. The paperwork was there and was not being processed, and uh, they felt that you needed to get, and I was soon to conclude that you needed to get direction to get somebody to process the paperwork that had already been there. Now, these were projects that had already been approved. They, you know, they, were, right. they were through the pipeline. It was just a, amending. Who, who else had you talked? What other people did you talk to at HUD in the course of your dealing in this housing area? The, um, the, the, uh, we mentioned Pierce and Deborah Dean. And you mentioned uh, Barksdale, Barksdale at one point. And um, Silvio de Martimus was the, I, I don't know if he was the Federal Housing Commissioner or the acting Federal Housing Commissioner. But. Okay. Just those four people were the only people at HUD you ever directly talked to, whether it be in person or in the on phone? A, on any of these projects, yes. Well, overall. I well, don't mean you met someone at a social yeah. occasion, but on any business, government, housing related matter? Just those four. Okay. And each of the other three was just that before and after situation or no? Uh, Do you have any lengthy conversations with any of them or repeated conversations with any of the others? I'm not saying is it one or is it two or yeah, is it three, yeah. but did you? I had many, as we've, I'm kind of 
Go reorganizing ahead. my mind. And Barksdale had a lot of conversations on Corinthians. On uh, Corinthians, yeah. New Jersey. Right. On uh, Silvio de Bartolomus, um, I had known him socially, politically socially. Right. Uh, not a social friend, but political type thing. And I've had conversations with him, but I don't recall that I ever talked to him about any specific projects, but I have had more than just casual conversations with How him. How many? Five? I'm, I don't know that I've even had five on business relationship. Okay. On Deborah Dean, is just those few business deals that we've discussed. Right. Let me ask you just, uh, this is an, in have you visited all three of these projects you worked on? Three of these projects you worked on? Have you seen any of them? Uh, I, have, I have not visited them. I've seen the pictures and the You've never visited them? No. So how do you know that they're bringing all this good well, second-hand observation? From, from the developers who manage them and from the reports that uh, they Have you ever met anyone who's living in one of these projects, either the Puerto Rico, the Corinthian? No, I've, or I've not been to Puerto Rico, of course, and uh, uh, I have not gone out to the housing project and been So in you never met any of the people who have been there subsequently? Just, just the reports from You ever meet any of the people who are managing it or running it? Yes, or? those are the people that are reporting. Those are the people who are, I didn't catch that, that are reporting to us on the results. I see. So you've just read the reports, but never went out and visited right. any of these uh, projects. But by the way, on behalf of the developers, uh, we, would, we would urge and invite the committee to go see these projects. Yeah, I don't think the, 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 the good of these projects is in dispute. Yeah, it shouldn't be, because they okay. are really uh, That's not what's here. What's here is uh, some other issues. Let me ask you this question. How did you get into this to begin with? You left the cabinet in 1983, was it? Yeah. How did, you know, here you are an interior secretary, you know all about lands in the West and all these other things. How did you get into housing? How did this happen? Uh, Joe Strauss of Phoenix Associates and I met and... Uh, How did you meet? Just at a, incidentally at a party or something like that? We met... Uh, I was working at the Heritage Foundation for the first several months afterwards, and he was a close friend with the executive director of the Citizens for America. And he was not in, in HUD at that time. He had already left HUD? That's correct. And he came over to you and, and suggested... He, he came over to you and just suggested there be an association. You and he have some kind of association. That's correct. And right after that, you signed up. How did he explain this to you? Why did he want you to be involved? You knew nothing about housing. Because I had credibility in the community and could help attract clients. But, Mr. And Watt, yeah, there are, well, there are so many people with credibility. Did you attract clients to the uh, yes. two Phoenix Associates? Well, I always want to believe I did, yeah. But did Phoenix Associates consummate any successful deals, non-HUD deals even, by some, some people who you originally brought to Phoenix Associates? Uh, it's hard, hard to tell, you know, what that relationship, I don't want to claim more than I should, but uh, I'd like... Well, did you spend much time bringing clients in? I guess the, the test of that is that my partners and associates feel I did, so that's the test. No, well, they may have decided, I mean, the way it looks to this gentleman is they paid you to make a couple of phone calls to HUD, not to bring in clients. So uh, I'd like to be dissuaded that there was some other thing we, we did. Uh, Since uh, I do want to believe all this, well, yeah. I'll stop the... Yeah, I think ahead. that's a good place to stop. <laughs> no, 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 I haven't stopped. I'm, I'm just, I was going to say that I think I want to be convinced this was a very moral endeavor. Uh, I didn't say I wanted to stop the testimony. So, uh, so what clients did you, um, so what clients did you bring in there? I, I have uh, no recollection of that, and it would... It, I don't know that it's relevant, and if you think... Oh, it's it, relevant because, again, we have to... Phoenix Associates seems to be at the center of this. Uh, the question is, were you hired, and you may not know, but were you hired to make a few phone calls, someone who had no knowledge in housing, who was hired, in your words, for credibility? I would posit to say there are probably half the people in this room who have credibility. You didn't understand the housing projects or know them. You go back to the partisan word you don't like, it strikes, strikes anyone as sort of influence peddling. Because you were in the cabinet, Pierce was in the cabinet, you didn't know housing, 
you didn't know any of these projects, you've never visited any of them, that the only reason you were hired, you only spent 10 hours by your own admission, something's amok, 10 hours dealing with the HUD agents, yeah. and, agencies. And because I'm the one under oath, I didn't use the 10-hour figure. Yes, I did. That's correct. What you said, to correct the record, is you met a half-hour meeting with Pierce, made four phone calls before, four phone calls after, of a very simple nature. And, uh, you know. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And here you are. 169,000, 300,000, but 131,000 goes to Mr. Strauss and 169,000 goes to you. Doesn't that strike you as wrong? <clears throat> is your credibility so much better than anybody else's? Uh, or is it who you knew? I mean, isn't that what we're talking about? Not credibility, but who you knew. Did you know Sam Pierce very well? Did you ever see him, you ever, you ever have a lengthy conversation with him? Congressman, it, uh, the relationship I had with Sam Pierce was a good one, and it was based upon credibility and, and competency and respect. Uh, that's what was being the basis, and that's what uh, well, Sam, I, Sam Pierce knew he could depend upon. So, so let's just get this in context. You don't know anything about housing. We're making decisions on housing here. And you come, and the reason that you should be paid in a moral, ethical way, $169,000, is simply because you are credible, not because of any other reason. Is that, is that basically what you're saying? I have repeatedly... You certainly didn't convince people, you didn't know the details of the housing projects. I they knew. taught you something about them, but you were not an expert in housing. You, by your own admission, nor in tax syndication, nor in management, nor was this a lifelong passion of yours, because you were at least at that point aware of being lured by the crumbs of subsidies and very condemnatory about it, and you walk in and you make a huge sum of money. That doesn't strike you as wrong? Not illegal, wrong. You didn't add anything to the project other than that you knew Sam Pierce. You didn't know enough about the project to say, I know, I verified the financial statements, etc. You simply were saying to Sam Pierce, the people I'm bringing in with me are nice people. I know them well. And if you weren't being paid a nickel for it, there still might be something wrong, but people might tend to believe it. But when you're being paid such a huge sum of money for so little effort, then one thinks that maybe you weren't vouching for what good people they were, but it was simply a contractual cash and carry deal. And I still can't believe you don't see anything wrong with this. You can respond. Tell me why you don't see anything wrong with this. Uh, Just flesh it out, other than saying you had credibility. Because very few people get paid by the government $169,000 for simply being credible. I'd like the record to show that uh, the summary of uh, Congressman Schumer uh, is not my summary. The record and shows that by and, its nature, and Mr. Secretary. His, They're my words, not yours. His characterization are not mine, but his, as he just said, and that I do not associate with them, uh, and I think that's enough said. Could, could you, could you, I'd be happy to yield. Was he factually inaccurate in anything he said? His characterization and expression are not reflective of what I've testified to earlier. Uh, his presentation is not as I have presented it. His. Well, were there factual inaccuracies you could point to? I did not hear any, I must tell you. Uh, I did, and uh, I just want the record to note that. I just have one more question. Uh, are, are you two, 
A and B, one A and B. Have you ever lobbied, sorry, have you ever used your credibility and gone to other agencies in a similar way to pr promote and produce projects, not in HUD? and be paid a fee for them, for your credibility? Uh, not to promote a project. To, uh, well, well, you've no. paid a fee to do something with other government agencies yes. after you left government. What yes. agencies were they? Uh, I did some work. Uh, at Energy. I'll have, to ch I'll have to supply that in. I, uh... Well, some work at Energy. Is that pretty much your recollection? Others? This is not a, I mean, this is something that it would seem to me if you wanted to tell the truth, you, could, you would remember. This is not a little speckle. That really is. I, what do you mean it's not a little speckle? If you did work and lobbied another cabinet secretary, undersecretary, and another agency and was paid a fee for it, it seems like the kind of thing that a person of your intelligence, which I don't doubt, would remember. Oh, yeah, it's an honorable profession. I don't mean to, to suggest that. It's an honorable profession. I frankly didn't do much of it. Uh, Were you paid fees to work with any other agencies? Yes. Energy. I've any others? Energy. I did some work with BIA, Department of Interior. But it, only BIA because the statutory Bureau of Indian Affairs. Bureau of Indian Affairs, yeah. Um, I did. Um, I represented uh, some clients, um, savings and loan. What federal home loan? You bank went to. Board the, you called up the federal home officials at the federal home loan bank board. Okay, those are three. There may be others, just to make there, the record yeah, clear. Yeah, there may be, but yeah. Okay. Obviously, that's not been a big role of mine, and I've moved on to other things. Right. Um, any other projects other than Section 8 Mod Rehab within HUD? No. Just Section 8 Mod Rehab. And I, I need to, I'm going to fudge a little bit on Go that ahead. with Corinthian Towers. I'm not positive okay. if that's substantial rehabilitation or moderate rehabilitation. I think it was substantial when it was first authorized some many years ago, and uh, frankly, I've tried to read on that to get prepared for this, and I've had read things that say it's one, and right. sometimes it's the other. Because stuff. Mr. Strauss said in the Wall Street Journal that you worked on a dozen projects with him within HUD. All of those were moderate section, uh, moderate section eight. Yeah, I couldn't. I I did read that story yesterday, and uh, I can't create that many in my. My memory. I'm more interested in not how many, but if there were other, because we're trying to see, I know the chairman has expressed an interest in whether this extends beyond just the moderate Section okay. 8. I'm, I'm comfortable that, uh, that I have not. I don't know of any. I know there was no UDAG or, or those other programs. I think we've covered the three that I had the lead in. Okay. And finally, are you a registered lobbyist or have you ever been? No. Mr. Chairman, uh, I thank you. I think this speaks for itself. Uh, $169,000 on one project for a half hour meeting with the secretary, eight perfunctory phone calls on a subject the gentleman admittedly doesn't know very much about. Something is very wrong. One question, Mr. Watt, because I know you are very proud of the integrity with which you did your job. And, and uh, get across why many of us are more distressed than you by, you, by your role in this, frankly. I guess I, I wanted to know your reaction. Suppose when you were the Secretary of Interior, someone had said, look, this project is bogged down in the interior bureaucracy, and there are a lot of projects competing for approval. If you pay me and my associates $300,000 out of private money, not government money, I'm an old friend of James Watts. I will go see him, and as a result of that conversation, our project will get picked out of a pile. Now, I know you say you would not have wanted to run the department that way, but inevitably there are pressures. If someone had been going around town saying, for a fee of $300,000 to be split among me and some other people, I will go have a meeting with Secretary Watt, 
And on the basis of that, I think we can get this project approved. What would your reaction have been? As a, as a, as a as secretary. An official? Um, well, as a secretary, I never focused on it. I understand, but. And uh, with hindsight, I would presume that uh, there were probably lots of law firms and uh, lobbyists that uh, did that, but I was unaware of it at the time. I didn't real. I, I Would you have been happy to have people in Washington say that, look, I, I've never been an expert in this field. It's a brand new field to me. But I, I know Jim Watt pretty good. We worked together on some things. For $300,000, I'll go see Watt, and uh, that'll give us a very, very good chance to get something which we otherwise wouldn't get. Would you have been happy to have had people think that of you? Uh, you know, we, we hear this. That, that goes on. My name has been used by all I kinds said, of people. I suppose it was accurate. In this case, it's accurate. Well, I assume, with, you know, I assume it is. We hear about the big fees that these lawyers make, the Bob Strausses, and you know, I, I get in trouble with using a, a Democrat's name and don't want to do that. But Not the Republic, Republicans, no. Republican Democrats, big law firms. Right. <laughs> Uh, in fact, I'm going to file a constitutional amendment that Mr. Strauss may not be the Democratic representative in any further bipartisan commission. <laughs> uh, you know, these, we hear these big fees all the time. So I assume that that has been the case. If it was accurately represented, I mean, well, let me rephrase it then. If, if you knew that someone was saying that uh, for $300,000 I can go to Jim Watt, and I don't know anything about this, but I'm a friend of his and he respects me, and I can get your project better treatment than other projects similarly situated, would you have been happy to, to, to have that situation obtained? Well, I, I don't want to turn my back on any friend. You know, I've had, uh, uh, I didn't know, it didn't, I presume it happened. Uh, and you think that would have, you, you would have said that's okay, I run my, that's the way I run my department? That's one of the ways I run my department? Uh, Mr. White, I can tell you, I the, think the had record, you, the rec excuse me, let me say, uh, you testified before subcommittees on which I sat several times. I think when you were the secretary, if I or anyone had said to you, Mr. Secretary, we understand that for three hundred thousand dollars, someone can come see you for about a half hour and get special treatment for the project, not based on the expertise he or she has, not based on his or her ability to argue that this is a superior project, but based on that friendship that you could get special treatment. I think you would have been justifiably indignant, and that's why so many of us are distressed uh, at this situation. Mr. Watt, um, I, I want to sincerely thank you for being here for three and a half hours, and it may be a little longer. I, I have to catch a plane for a four o'clock appointment in, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, not on housing. Um, but um, I just have to reconcile a lot of things that I don't think I'm going to be able to reconcile right now, but one of them I just need to, and that is the relationship that you had with uh, Ms. Siegel and Mr. Gould and Mr. Uh, Strauss, both the latter two, all of them are experts in housing, and all of them knew that the decisions were made not by the bureaucrat, not by the bureaucrats or what I would call the civil servants, but by the political appointees. And you seem to have been astounded to learn that, that there were no regulations and that Deborah Gordine was a key player and that there was a committee and so on. Is it your honest testimony before us today that Mr. Gould and Mr. Strauss didn't inform you who made the decisions, that there were some key players that you needed to get a hold of? I can't believe that if it's no. true. I mean, I mean, I just, it's hard for me to believe. I, I, I have to believe what you tell me, but it's... Okay. it's it, the, uh, the issues that, w that we were dealing with were issues that the career employees did have control over and had to review because they related to subjects that there were regulations and guidelines about, such as eligible cost items, rents, and those things. And it is my understanding, and therefore my, my testimony to you, Congressman, based on that understanding, that those regulations were in effect and uh, that these projects dealt with not the selection process of, what, what's the phrase I'm looking for, fair sharing, or, uh, well, it, it, I just, I hear your testimony. Testimony is your testimony before us is that the regulations were in effect. They weren't. I'm astounded. No, no, Congressman, look, we're but not communicating. Let me, let me try once okay, more. I'm, I'm, uh, okay. We're not dealing with the selection process when I'm talking about those relationships. Corinthians Towers was already selected. It was in B. We're talking about the rules and regulations that I believe 
were in effect that control the review process of the career employees as they look to these projects after they've been selected. I, I have to say to you that your definition of selected is kind of shaky, isn't it? Uh, selected, Not at all. You mean it was a fait accompli, this project was going to happen? Corinthian Towers had been authorized and had been uh, received is, is funds. It, you, you worked on three projects. Is it your testimony that all three had been selected and you had nothing to do no, with no, influencing no, 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 the selection? No, no. We're talking about the role with Deborah Dean. Wasn't that your question? Yeah, let me just, uh, if I'm going to ask for your patience with me and, and, and just say that I literally have 25 minutes, 20 minutes to get to the airport, let me just ask you this. Did you um, have uh, a meeting with Deborah um, Gordeen before you met with uh, the secretary and afterwards to report back to her? I did. Okay. And that, basically, your testimony is not that she was a key player, that you didn't know that she was a key player. It just happened that you lucked out and she was a key player. That is your testimony? No. Okay. I don't use the word lucked out or anything. I dealt with Secretary Pierce. Okay. He's the one that said he would check it out. So I informed her what I was coming in for as my staff was always informed before people came to me so that I could be prepared for that meeting, and I informed her as I left what, what the conversations but, but were. Th then I think it's fair to say that she had an acute interest in why you were seeing them both before and what you talked about afterwards. I, I always presumed that any executive secretary should have. Well, she wasn't an executive secretary. She was administrative assistant okay, or chief, oh, chief of staff. Okay, I mean, chief, yeah. uh, and she did not sit in, in any of those meetings? She did not. Okay. And my chief of staff, or whatever, we didn't use that title at the Department of Interior, but m my man cleared everything that was coming in and he cleared everything that was going out. I treated Secretary Pierce as I would have wanted to be treated. Okay. Thank you. And I just have to comment, your wife who is behind you is a very nice picture, a very gentle lady, and a, I feel for your family in the course of the kinds of things you have to deal with. I'm Thank very you. Proud. You, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. You were very proud of what? I'm very proud to be associated with this family. Thank I, you. I know. We that. appreciate your presence. We are almost finished, uh, Ms. Watt, and uh, there's only a couple of technical issues we need to clear up. It is our understanding, and correct me if we are wrong, that HUD had decided to award 600 units to a particular public housing authority in Puerto Rico but upon reconsideration decided that 600 was too much and they reduced it to 300. And then you were hired to recoup the, the 300 units that were originally allocated to this public housing authority. Is that correct? That's not my understanding. Tell me what is your understanding. Uh, my understanding is that uh, we had a, a client that had roughly, and I'm rounding, uh, roughly 600 units that he wanted to put into the mod rehab program. And at Who that, was that client? Um, I think the name will come to me as we start Fine. talking. I, I Fine. want to give it to you. And, uh, I've got his picture in my mind. I, I'll pull the name out in a minute. Okay. Um, and it, we felt that there was a good chance of getting a, an allocation to Puerto Rico because of at least two factors that, I, that my memory tells me were going on about then. There'd been a big mudslide and a large unit of, I think, roughly 500, and I'm fudging on that figure. Units had been uh, closed down by EPA because of, I think, lead or some contaminant poisoning. So there was a big thrust to build new housing units in Puerto Rico. Uh, I spoke to Secretary Pierce about those 600 units. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, that many or more were allocated to Puerto Rico. Uh, our client then went in to the Puerto Rican C Public Housing Authority and competed for those houses or housing units and uh, was awarded uh, roughly 300 of them, not the full amount that, uh, frankly, I had hoped would be the case. Uh, did, did Secretary Pierce during that meeting indicate to you that giving 600 units to your client would appear unseemly, but he will make it up to you and you'll get 300 more units later, which turned out to be the Essex units? He did not. He did not. At no time did he sort of indicate to you that there... He was very clear not to indicate that he was committing anything. Was there anybody else at that meeting? No. 
You don't believe Miss Deborah Dean was at that meeting? She, I would have briefed her going in and coming out. No, no, but she was not at the meeting. No. No, she was not. Final question I have is a, is a somewhat technical one. In getting the $300,000 fee from Miss Siegel, of which you received only 160 some, your testimony is that Phoenix Associates provided you with technical backup and expertise. Didn't Miss Siegel have all the technical backup and expertise imaginable? Isn't she a seasoned housing specialist? Yes. Well, why would she pay 130 some, 130 thousand some dollars to get the expertise that she had in shop, in house? She, she did. It. She, I was the one that directed it that way. I know you directed it that way, but because of my, Joe, Phoenix Associates or Joe was, was my partner. So it was just a fee-splitting arrangement. He was my, my confidence and my support and my backup situation. Well, you've repeatedly said that everything you did was legal, uh, which may well be true. Uh, you've also used the word repeatedly moral and ethical. In retrospect, don't you think it would be moral and ethical to take this fee, which we have established was gained with a few hours of labor, and maybe give it to the homeless? Would that not be a more moral and ethical gesture? Congressman, uh, maybe I already have. But that's a private, charity is a private matter. And uh, your testimony is that uh, that uh, my testimony is that charity is a private matter, yes. and it wouldn't be fair for me to push you on such an issue, nor would it is it fair, nor do I accept any pushing from you on how I live out that portion of my well, life. Well, I don't think that's a reciprocal issue in the sense that you received a three hundred thousand dollar fee in conjunction with low cost housing, housing for poor people. And it's been established to everybody's satisfaction, perhaps except yours, Mr. Watt, that very little effort went into earning this. Yeah. It appears to many that these were conceivably legal but ill-gotten gains. And since you place so much emphasis on morality and ethics, and since homelessness is such a pressing issue, has it occurred to you, perhaps, that that would sweep away some of the cloud? which clearly is present. There is no cloud in my mind, and uh, I prefer to keep uh, that dimension of my life private. Well, Ms. Watt, uh, we will uh, be communicating with you in writing uh, uh, with respect to the written submissions that we, ag we agreed to. We want to thank you for your testimony. This hearing is concluded. Good job. For more information about the issues discussed at this hearing, you can write to the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Housing. The address is B349A. Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. Up next, following a short break, a look at the week's action by the Supreme Court on Supreme Court Review.